The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1. Book 5, The Third Estate. Chapter 6, Storm and Victory. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 5, Chapter 6, Storm and Victory. But to the living and the struggling a new fourteenth morning dawns. Under all roofs of this distracted city is the notice of a drama, not untragical, crowding towards solution. The bustlings and preparings, the tremors and menaces, the tears that fell from old eyes. This day, my sons, ye shall quit you like men. By the memory of your father's wrongs, by the hope of your children's rights. Tyranny impends in red wrath. Help for you is none, if not in your own right hands. This day ye must do or die. From earliest light a sleepless permanent committee has heard the old cry, now waxing almost frantic mutinous. Arms! Arms! Provost Flacel, or what traitors there are among you, may think of those charleville boxes, a hundred and fifty thousand of us, and but the third man furnished with so much as a pike. Arms are the one thing needful. With arms we are an unconquerable, man-defying national guard. Without arms, a rabble to be whiffed with grape-shot. Happily, the word has arisen, for no secret can be kept, that there lie muskets at the Hotel des Invalides. Thitherto will we, King's Procureur, Monsieur Ethy de Corny, and whatsoever of authority a permanent committee can lend, shall go with us. Bessonval's camp is there. Perhaps he will not fire on us. If he kill us, we shall but die. Alas, poor Bessonval, with his troops melting away in that manner, has not the smallest humour to fire. At five o'clock this morning, as he lay dreaming, oblivious in the École Militaire, a figure stood suddenly at his bedside, with face rather handsome, eyes inflamed, speech rapid and curt, air audacious. Such a figure drew Priam's curtains. The message and monition of the figure was that resistance would be hopeless, that if blood flowed, woe to him who shed it. Thus spoke the figure and vanished. Withal, there was a kind of eloquence that struck one. Bessonval admits that he should have arrested him, but did not. Who this figure with inflamed eyes, with speech rapid and curt, might be? Bessonval knows, but mentions not. Camille de Moulin? Pythagorean Machiavelli, inflamed with violent motions all night at the Palais Royal? Fame names him young Monsieur Maillard, then shuts her lips about him for ever. In any case, behold, about nine in the morning, our national volunteers rolling in long, wide flood, southwestward to the Hotel des Invalides, in search of the one thing needful. King's procureur, Monsieur Ethy de Corny, and officials are there. The curé of Saint-Étienne-du-Mont marches unpacific at the head of his militant parish. The clerks of the Bazoche in red coats we see marching. Now volunteers of the Bazoche, the volunteers of the Palais Royal, national volunteers, numerable by tens of thousands of one heart and mind. The king's muskets are the nation's. Think, old Monsieur de Sombroy, how in this extremity thou wilt refuse them. Old Monsieur de Sombroy would fain hold parley, send couriers, but it skills not. The walls are scaled, no invalid firing a shot, the gates must be flung open. Patriotism rushes in, tumultuous, from ground cell up to ridge tile, through all rooms and passages, rummaging distractedly for arms. What cellar or what cranny can escape it? The arms are found, all safe there, lying packed in straw, apparently with a view to being burnt. More ravenous than famishing lions over dead prey, the multitude, with clangour and vociferation, pounces on them, struggling, dashing, clutching, to the jamming up to the pressure, fracture and probable extinction of the weaker patriot. And so, with such protracted crash of deafening, most discordant orchestra music, the scene is changed, and eight and twenty thousand sufficient firelocks are on the shoulders of so many national guards, lifted thereby out of darkness into fiery light. Let Bessonval look at the glitter of these muskets as they flash by. Guard Francais, it is said, have cannon levelled on him, ready to open, if need be, from the other side of the river. Motionless sits he, astonished, one may flatter oneself, at the proud bearing, fier contenance, of the Parisians. 
and now to the Bastille, ye intrepid Parisians. There grapeshot still threatens, thither all men's thoughts and steps are now tending. Old de Launay, as we hinted, withdrew into his interior soon after midnight of Sunday. He remains there ever since, hampered, as all military gentlemen now are, in the saddest conflict of uncertainties. The Hotel de Villa invites him to admit national soldiers, which is a soft name for surrendering. On the other hand, His Majesty's orders were precise. His garrison is but 82 old invalides, reinforced by 32 young Swiss. His walls, indeed, are nine feet thick. He has cannon and powder, but alas, only one day's provision of victuals. The city, too, is French, the poor garrison mostly French. Rigorous old Delaunay, think what thou wilt do. All morning since nine there has been a cry everywhere, To the Bastille! Repeated deputations of citizens have been here, passionate for arms, whom de Launay has got dismissed by soft speeches through portholes. Towards noon, Elector Turio de la Rosière gains admittance, finds de Launay indisposed for surrender, nay, disposed for blowing up the place, rather. Turio mounts with him to the battlements. Heaps of paving stones, old iron and missiles lie piled, cannon all duly levelled, in every embrasure a cannon, only drawn back a little. But outwards, behold, O Turio, how the multitude flows on, welling through every street, toxin furiously peeling, all drums beating the general, the suburb Saint Antoine rolling hitherward wholly as one man. Such vision spectral, yet Real, thou, O Tyrio, as from thy mount of vision, beholdest in this moment, prophetic of what other phantasmagories and loud gibbering spectral realities, which thou yet beholdest not, but shalt. Que voulez-vous, said de Launay, turning pale at the sight, with an air of reproach, almost of menace. Monsieur, said Tyrio, rising into the moral sublime, what mean you? Consider if I could not precipitate both of us from this height, say only a hundred feet, exclusive of the walled ditch. Whereupon de Launay fell silent. Tyrio shows himself from some pinnacle to comfort the multitude, becoming suspicious, from essent, then descends, departs with protest, with warning addressed also to the invalid, on whom, however, it produces but a mixed, indistinct impression. The old heads are none of the clearest. Besides, it is said, Delaunay has been profuse of beverages, prodigua de buisson. They think they will not fire. If not fired on, if they can help it, but must on the whole be ruled considerably by circumstances. Woe to thee, Delaunay, in such an hour, if thou canst not, taking some one firm decision, rule circumstances. Soft speeches will not serve. Hard grape shot is questionable but hovering between the two is unquestionable. Ever wilder swells the tide of men, their infinite hum waxing ever louder into imprecations, perhaps into crackle of stray musketry, which latter on walls nine feet thick cannot do execution. The outer drawbridge has been lowered for Turio. New deputation of citizens, it is the third and noisiest of all, penetrates that way into the outer court. Soft speeches producing no clearance of these, de Launay gives fire, pulls up his drawbridge. A slight sputter, which has kindled the too combustible chaos, made it a roaring fire chaos. Burst forth insurrection at sight of its own blood, for there were deaths by that sputter of fire, into endless rolling explosion of musketry, distraction, execration, and overhead from the fortress let one great gun with its grape shot go booming to show what we could do. The Bastille is besieged. On then, all Frenchmen that have hearts in their bodies, roar with all your throats of cartilage and metal, ye sons of liberty, stir spasmodically whatsoever of utmost faculty is in you, soul, body, or spirit, for it is the hour. Smite thou, Louis Tournay, Cartwright of the Marais, old soldier of the regiment Dauphine, smite at that outer drawbridge chain, though the fiery hail whistles round thee. Never over knave or fellow did thy axe strike such a stroke. Down with it, man, down with it to Orcus. Let the whole accursed edifice sink thither, and tyranny be swallowed up for ever. 
Mounted, some say on the roof of the guardroom, some on bayonets stuck into joints of the wall, Louis Tournay smites brave Aubin Bonnemere, also an old soldier, seconding him. The chain yields, breaks, the huge drawbridge slams down, thundering, avec fracas. Glorious, and yet, alas, it is still but the outworks. The eight grim towers with their invalid musketry, their paving stones and cannon mouths still soar aloft intact. Ditch yawning, impassable, stone faced, the inner drawbridge with its back towards us, the Bastille is still to take. To describe this siege of the Bastille, thought to be one of the most important in history, perhaps transcends the talent of mortals. Could one but, after infinite reading, get to understand so much as the plan of the building? But there is open esplanade at the end of the Rue Saint-Antoine. There are such forecourts, Cœur Avancé, Cœur de l'Orme, arched gateways where Louis Tournay now fights, then new drawbridges, dormant bridges, rampart bastions, and the grim eight towers, a labyrinthic mass, high frowning there of all ages from twenty years to four hundred and twenty, beleaguered in its last hour, as we said, by mere chaos come again. Ordnance of all calibres, throats of all capacities, men of all plans, every man his own engineer, seldom since the war of pygmies and cranes were there seen so anomalous a thing. Half pay Ali is home for a suit of regimentals, no one would heed him in coloured clothes. Half pay Ulin is haranguing Garde Francais in the Place de Grève. Frantic patriots pick up the grape shots, bear them, still hot or seemingly so, to the Hotel de Ville. Paris, you perceive, is to be burnt. Flacelle is pale to the very lips, for the roar of the multitude grows deep. Paris wholly has got to the acme of its frenzy, whirled all ways by panic madness. At every street barricade there whirls simmering a minor whirlpool, strengthening the barricade since God knows what is coming, and all minor whirlpools play distractedly into that grand fire maelstrom which is lashing round the Bastille. And so it lashes and it roars, Cola, the wine merchant, has become an impromptu cannoneer. Si Jorge of the marine service, fresh from Brest, ply the king of Siam's cannon. Singular, if we were not used to the like. Jorge lay last night, taking his ease at his inn. The king of Siam's cannon also lay, knowing nothing of him, for a hundred years. Yet now, at the right instant, they have got together and discourse eloquent music. For hearing what was toward, Georges sprang from the Brest Diligence and ran. Guard Francaise will also be here with real artillery, were not the walls so thick. Upwards from the esplanade, horizontally from all neighbouring roofs and windows, flashes one irregular deluge of musketry without effect. The invalid lie flat, firing comparatively at their ease from behind stone, hardly through portholes, show the tip of a nose. We fall shot and make no impression. Let conflagration rage of whatsoever is combustible. Guard rooms are burnt, invalid mess rooms. A distracted peruke maker with two fiery torches is for burning the salpetra of the arsenal. Had not a woman run screaming, had not a patriot with some tincture of natural philosophy instantly struck the wind out of him, butt of musket on pit of stomach, overturned barrels and stayed the devouring element. A young, beautiful lady, seized escaping in these outer courts and thought falsely to be Delaunay's daughter, shall be burnt in Delaunay's sight. She lies swooned on a paillasse, but again a patriot, it is brave Aubin Bonnemere, the old soldier, dashes in and rescues her. Straw is burnt, three cartloads of it, hauled thither, go up in white smoke, almost to the choking of patriotism itself, so that Elie had, with singed brows, to drag back one cart and Raoul, the gigantic haberdasher, another. Smoke as of Tophet, confusion as of Babel, noise as of the crack of doom. Blood flows, the element of new madness. The wounded are carried into houses of the Rue Cerisay. The dying leave their last mandate not to yield till the accursed stronghold fall. And yet, alas, how fall? The walls are so thick. Deputations three in number arrive from the Hotel de Ville. Abbe Fouché, who was of one, can say, with what almost superhuman courage of benevolence. These wave their town flag in the arched gateway and stand rolling their drum, but to no purpose. 
In such crack of doom, Delaunay cannot hear them, dare not believe them. They return with justified rage, the whew of lead still singing in their ears. What to do? The firemen are here, squirting with their fire pumps on the invalid cannon to wet the touch holes. They unfortunately cannot squirt so high, but produce only clouds of spray. Individuals of classical knowledge propose catapults. Santerre, the sonorous brewer of the suburb Saint Antoine, advises rather that the place be fired by a mixture of phosphorus and oil of turpentine spouted up through forcing pumps. Oh, Spinola, Santerre, hast thou the mixture ready? Every man his own engineer. And still the fire deluge abates not, even women are firing, and Turks, at least one woman with her sweetheart and one Turk. Guard Francais have come, real cannon, real cannoneers. A Chamaillard is busy, half pay a lee, half pay Julian rage in the midst of thousands. How the great Bastille clock ticks inaudible in its inner court there, at its ease, hour after hour, as if nothing special for it or the world were passing. It told one when the firing began and is now pointing towards five, and still the firing slakes not. Far down in their vaults the seven prisoners hear muffled din as of earthquakes, their turnkeys answer vaguely. Woe to thee, Delaunay, with thy poor hundred invalid. Brolier is distant with his ears heavy. Bessonval hears, but can send no help. One poor troop of hussars has crept, reconnoitring cautiously along the quay as far as the Pont Neuf. We are come to join you, said the captain, for the crowd seems shoreless. A large-headed dwarfish individual of smoke-bleared aspect shambles forward, opening his blue lips, for there is sense in him, and croaks, A light then, and give us your arms. The Hussar captain is too happy to be escorted to the barriers and dismissed on parole. Who the Scot individual was? Men answer, it is Monsieur Marat, author of the excellent Pacific Avi du Peuple. Great truly, O thou remarkable dogleech, is this thy day of emergence and new birth, and yet this same day come four years. But let the curtains of the future hang. What shall Delaunay do? One thing only Delaunay could have done, what he said he would do. Fancy him sitting from the first with lighted taper within arm's length of the powder magazine, motionless like old Roman senator or bronze lamp holder, coldly apprising Turio and all men by a slight motion of his eyes what his resolution was. Harmless he sat there, while unharmed, but the king's fortress meanwhile could, might, would or should in no wise be surrendered save to the king's messenger, one old man's life worthless, so it be lost with honour. But think, ye brawling canaille, how will it be when a whole Bastille springs skyward? In such statuesque, taper-holding attitude, one fancies Delaunay might have left Turio, the red clerks of the Bazoche, curé of St. Stephen, and all the tag-rag and bobtail of the world, to work their will. And yet withal he could not do it. Hast thou considered how each man's heart is so tremulously responsive to the hearts of all men? Hast thou noted how omnipotent is the very sound of many men? How their shriek of indignation pulses the strong soul, their howl of contumely withers with unfelt pangs? The Ritter Gluck confessed that the ground tone of the noblest passage in one of his noblest operas was the voice of the populace he had heard at Vienna crying to their Kaiser, Bread! Bread! Great is the combined voice of men, the utterance of their instincts which are truer than their thoughts. It is the greatest a man encounters among the sounds and shadows which make up this world of time. He who can resist that has his footing somewhere beyond time. Delaunay could not do it. Distracted, he hovers between the two, hopes in the middle of despair, surrenders not his fortress, declares that he will blow it up, seizes torches to blow it up, and does not blow it. Unhappy old Delaunay, it is the death agony of thy Bastille and thee. Jail, jailering and jailer, all three, such as they may have been, must finish. For four hours now has the world bedlam roared, call it the world chimera blowing fire. The poor invalid have sunk under their battlements or rise only with reversed muskets. They have made a white flag of napkins, go beating the chamade, or seeming to beat, for one can hear nothing. 
The very Swiss at the portcullis look weary of firing, disheartened in the fire deluge. A porthole at the drawbridge is opened as by one that would speak. See, Hussier Maillard, the shifty man, on his plank, swinging over the abyss of that stone ditch, plank resting on parapet, balanced by weight of patriots. He hovers, perilous, such a dove towards such an ark. Deftly, thou shifty usher, one man already fell and lies smashed far down there against the masonry. Usher Maillard falls not. Deftly, unerring, he walks with outspread palm. The Swiss holds a paper through his porthole. The shifty usher snatches it and returns. Terms of surrender, pardon, immunity to all. Are they accepted? Foi d'officier, on the word of an officer answers half pay Hulin or half pay Ailey, for men do not agree on it. They are, sinks the drawbridge. Usher Maillard, bolting it when down, rushes in the living deluge. The Bastille is fallen. Victoire! La Bastille est prise! End of Book 5, Chapter 6《The French Revolution: A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume One, Book Five, The Third Estate, Chapter Seven, Not a Revolt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan, Book Five, Chapter Seven, Not a Revolt. Why dwell on what follows? Hulin's foi d'officier should have been kept, but could not. The Swiss stand drawn up, disguised in white canvas smocks, the invalids without disguise, their arms all piled against the wall. The first rush of victors, in ecstasy that the death peril is past, leaps joyfully on their necks, but new victors rush, and ever new, also in ecstasy, not wholly of joy. As we said, it was a living deluge, plunging headlong, had not the Garde Francaise in their cool military way wheeled round with arms levelled, it would have plunged suicidally by the hundred or the thousand into the Bastille ditch. And so it goes plunging through court and corridor, billowing uncontrollable, firing from windows, on itself, in hot frenzy of triumph, of grief and vengeance for its slain. The poor invalides will fare ill, one Swiss, running off in his white smock, is driven back with a death thrust. Let all prisoners be marched to the town hall to be judged. Alas, already one poor invalid has his right hand slashed off him, his maimed body dragged to the Place de Grève and hanged there. This same right hand, it is said, turned back to Lournay from the powder magazine and saved Paris. De Launay, discovered in grey frock with poppy-coloured ribbon, is for killing himself with the sword of his cane. He shall to the Hôtel de Ville, Ulan Maillard and others escorting him, Eli marching foremost with a capitulation paper on his sword's point. Through roarings and cursings, through hustlings, clutchings, and at last through strokes, your escort is hustled aside, fell down, Ulan seeks exhausted on a heap of stones. Miserable de Lorne. He shall never enter the Hôtel de Ville, only his bloody hair cue held up in a bloody hand. That shall enter for a sign. The bleeding trunk lies on the steps there. The head is off through the streets, ghastly, aloft on a pike. Rigorous de Lorne has died, crying out, O oh, friends, kill me fast. Merciful de Lorme must die, though gratitude embraces him in this fearful hour and will die for him, it avails not. Brothers, your wrath is cruel. Your place de grève has become a throat of the tiger, full of mere fierce bellowings and thirst of blood. One other officer is massacred. One other invalide is hanged on the lamp-iron. With difficulty, with generous perseverance, the Garde Francais will save the rest. Provost Flessel, stricken long since with the paleness of death, must descend from his seat to be judged at the Palais Royal, alas, to be shot dead by an unknown hand at the turning of the first street. O oh, evening sun of July, how at this hour thy beams fall slant on reapers amid peaceful woody fields, on old women spinning in cottages, on ships far out in the silent main, on 
Balls at the Orangerie of Versailles, where high rouge dames of the palace are even now dancing with double-jacketed hussar officers, and also on this roaring hell porch of a Hotel de Ville. Babel Tower, with the confusion of tongues, were not bedlam added with the conflagration of thoughts, was no type of it. One forest of distracted steel bristles endless in front of an electoral committee points itself in horrid radii against this and the other accused breast. It was the Titans warring with Olympus, and they scarcely crediting it have conquered. Prodigy of prodigies, delirious, as it could not but be. Denunciation, vengeance, blaze of triumph on a dark ground of terror, all outward, all inward things fallen into one general wreck of madness. Electoral committee? Had it a thousand throats of brass, it would not suffice. Abbe Lefebvre in the vaults down below is black as Vulcan, distributing that five thousand weight of powder with what perils these eight and forty hours. Last night a patriot in liquor insisted on sitting to smoke on the edge of one of the powder barrels. There smoked he, independent of the world, till the abbe purchased his pipe for three francs and pitched it far. Ailey in the grand hall, electoral committee looking on, sits with drawn sword bent in three places, with battered helm, for he was of the Queen's regiment, cavalry, with torn regimentals, face singed and soiled, comparable, some think, to an antique warrior, judging the people, forming a list of Bastilla heroes. Oh, friends, stain not with blood the greenest laurels ever gained in this world, such is the burden of Ailey's song, could it be but listened to. Courage, Ailey, courage, ye municipal electors. A declining sun, the need of victuals and of telling news, will bring assuagement, dispersion. All earthly things must end. Along the streets of Paris circulate seven Bastille prisoners, born shoulder high, seven heads on pikes, the keys of the Bastille and much else. See also the Garde Francaise in their steadfast military way, marching home to their barracks with the Invalides and Swiss kindly enclosed in hollow square. It is one year and two months since these same men stood unparticipating with Brenos d'Auguste at the Palais de Justice when fate overtook Despremenil, and now they have participated and will participate. Not guard Francais henceforth, but centre grenadiers of the National Guard, men of iron discipline and humour, not without a kind of thought in them. Likewise, ashlar stones of the Bastille continue thundering through the dusk. Its paper archive shall fly white. Old secrets come to view, and long-buried despair finds voice. Read this portion of an old letter. If not for my consolation, Monseigneur would grant me for the sake of God and the most blessed Trinity that I could have news of my dear wife, were it only her name on card to show that she is alive. It were the greatest consolation I could receive. I should forever bless the greatness of Monseigneur. Poor prisoner, who namest thyself Kere Demery, and hast no other history. She is dead, that dead wife of thine, and thou art dead. Tis fifty years since thy breaking heart put this question, to be heard now, first, and long heard, in the hearts of men. But so does the July twilight thicken, so must Paris, as sick children and all distracted creatures do, brawl itself finally into a kind of sleep. Municipal electors, astonished to find their heads still uppermost, are home. Only Moreau de Saint-Marie, of tropical birth and heart, of coolest judgment, he with two others shall sit permanent at the town hall. Paris sleeps, gleams up with the illuminated city. Patrols go clashing without common watchword. There go rumours, alarms of war to the extent of 15,000 men marching through the suburb Saint-Antoine, who never got it marched through. Of the day's distraction judged by this of the night, Moreau de Saint-Marie, before rising from his seat, gave upwards of three thousand orders. What a head, comparable to Friar Bacon's brass head. Within it lies all Paris. Prompt must the answer be, right or wrong. In Paris is no other authority extant. 
seriously, a most cool, clear head, for which also thou, O brave Saint Marie, in many capacities, from august senator to merchant's clerk, book dealer, vice king, in many places, from Virginia to Sardinia, shalt ever as a brave man find employment. Bessonville has decamped under cloud of dusk amid a great affluence of people who did not harm him. He marches with faint growing tread down the left bank of the Seine all night towards infinite space. Resummoned shall Bessonval himself be for trial, for difficult acquittal. His king's troops, his royal allemand, are gone hence for ever. The Versailles ball and lemonade is done. The orangery is silent except for night birds. Over in the Salle des Menus, Vice President Lafayette, with unsnuffed lights, with some hundred of members stretched on tables round him, sits erect, out watching the bear. This day a second solemn deputation went to His Majesty, a second and then a third, with no effect. What will the end of these things be? In the court, all is mystery, not without whisperings of terror, though ye dream of lemonade and epaulettes, ye foolish women. His Majesty, kept in happy ignorance, perhaps dreams of double barrels and the woods of Meudon. Late at night, the Duc de Liancourt, having official right of entrance, gains access to the royal apartments, unfolds with earnest clearness in his constitutional way the Job's news. Mais, said poor Louis, c'est un revolt. Why, that is a revolt. Sire, answered Liancourt, it is not a revolt, it is a revolution. End of Book 5, Chapter 7《The French Revolution》A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume One, Book Five, The Third Estate, Chapter Eight, Conquering Your King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan, Book Five, Chapter Eight, Conquering Your King. On the morrow, a fourth deputation to the chateau is on foot, of a more solemn, not to say awful, character for, besides orgies on the orangery, it seems the grain convoys are all stopped, nor has Mirabeau's thunder been silent. Such deputation is on the point of setting out, when, lo, His Majesty himself, attended only by his two brothers, step in, quite in the paternal manner, announces that the troops and all causes of offence are gone, and henceforth there shall be nothing but trust, reconcilement, goodwill, whereof he permits and even requests a national assembly to assure Paris in his name. Acclamation, as of men suddenly delivered from death, gives answer. The whole assembly spontaneously rises to escort His Majesty back, interlacing their arms to keep off the excessive pressure from him, for all Versailles is crowding and shouting. The chateau musicians, with a felicitous promptitude, strike up the Seine de sa famille, bosom of one's family. The Queen appears at the balcony with her little boy and girl, kissing them several times. Infinite vivats spread far and wide, and suddenly there has come, as it were, a new heaven on earth. Eighty-eight august senators, Bailly, Lafayette, and our repentant archbishop among them, take coach for Paris, with a great intelligence, benedictions without end on their heads. From the Place Louis Cairns, where they alight all the way to the Hôtel de Ville, it is one sea of trickler cockades, of clear national muskets, one tempest of huzzahings, hand clappings, aided by occasional rollings of drum music. Harangues of due fervour are delivered, especially by Lally Tollendal, pious son of the ill-fated murdered Lally, on whose head, in consequence, a civic crown of oak or parsley is forced, which he forcibly transfers to Baiz. But surely, for one thing, the National Guard must have a general. Moreau de Saint-Marie, he of the three thousand orders, casts one of his significant glances on the bust of Lafayette, which has stood there ever since the American War of Liberty, whereupon, by acclamation, Lafayette is nominated. Again, in room of the slain traitor or quasi-traitor Flazel, President Bailly shall be mm, provost of the merchants? No, mayor of Paris. So be it, mayor de Paris. 
Mayor Bailly, General Lafayette, Viva Bailly, Viva Lafayette! The universal out-of-doors multitude rends the welcome in confirmation. And now, finally, let us to Notre Dame for a tedium. Towards Notre Dame Cathedral, in glad procession, these regenerators of the country walk through a jubilant people in fraternal manner, Abbe Lefebvre, still black with his gunpowder services, walking arm in arm with the white-stoled Archbishop. Poor Bailly comes upon the foundling children, sent to kneel to him, and weeps. Te Diem, our Archbishop officiating, is not only sung, but shot with blank cartridges. Our joy is boundless, as our woe threatened to be. Paris, by her own pike and musket and the valour of her own heart, has conquered the very war gods to the satisfaction now of majesty itself. A courier is, this night, getting under way for Necker, the people's minister, invited back by the king, by national assembly and nation, shall traverse France amid shoutings and the sound of trumpet and timbrel. Seeing which course of things, messieurs of the court triumvirate, messieurs of the dead-born Brolier ministry, and others such, consider that their part also is clear, to mount and ride. Off, ye two loyal Brolier's, Polignacs and princes of the blood, off while it is yet time. Did not the Palais Royal, in its late nocturnal violent motions, set a specific price, place of payment not mentioned, on each of your heads? With precautions, with the aid of pieces of cannon and regiments that can be depended on, Miss Seigneurs, between the sixteenth night and the seventeenth morning, get to their several roads, not without risk. Prince Condé has, or seems to have, men galloping at full speed, with a view, it is thought, to fling him into the river wires at Pont saint mayence The Polignacs travel disguised, friends, not servants, on their coach-box, Brolier has his own difficulties at Versailles, runs his own risks at Metz and Verdun, does nevertheless get safe to Luxembourg, and there rests. This is what they call the first emigration, determined on, as appears in full court conclave, His Majesty assisting, prompt he for his share of it to follow any counsel whatsoever. Three sons of France and four princes of the blood of St. Louis, says Weber, could not more effectually humble the burghers of Paris than by appearing to withdraw in fear of their life. Alas, the burghers of Paris bear it with unexpected stoicism. The man d'Artois indeed is gone, but has he carried, for example, the land d'Artois with him? Not even Bagatelle, the country house, which shall be useful as a tavern. Hardly the four valet breeches, leaving the breeches maker. As for old Foulon, one learns that he is dead. At least a sumptuous funeral is going on, the undertakers honouring him, if no other will. Antendon Bertier, his son-in-law, is still living, lurking. He joined Bessonval on that Eumenides Sunday, appearing to treat it with levity, and has now fled no man knows whither. The emigration has not gone many miles, Prince Condé hardly across the Wars, when His Majesty, according to arrangement, for the emigration also thought it might do good, undertakes a rather daring enterprise, that of visiting Paris in person. With a hundred members of assembly, with small or no military escort, which indeed he dismissed at the bridge of Sèvres, poor Louis sets out, leaving a desolate palace, a queen weeping, the present, the past, and the future all so unfriendly for her. At the barrier of Passy, Mayor Bailly in Grand Gala presents him with the keys, harangues him in academic style, mentions that it is a great day, that in Henri Quatre's case the king had to make conquest of his people, but in this happier case the people makes conquest of its king. A conquis son roi. The king, so happily conquered, drives forward slowly through a steel people, all silent or shouting only, Viva la nation, is harangued at the town hall by Moreau of the Three Thousand Orders, by King's procureur, Monsieur Ethi de Corny, by Lally Tonandal and others, knows not what to think of it or say of it, learns that he is restorer of French liberty, as a statue of him to be raised on the site of the Bastille shall testify to all men. 
Finally, he is shown at the balcony with a trickler cockade in his hat, is greeted now with vehement acclamation from square and street, from all windows and roofs, and so drives home again amid glad, mingled and, as it were, intermarried shouts of Vive le Roi and Vive la Nation, wearied but safe. It was Sunday when the red-hot balls hung over us in mid-air. It is now but Friday, and the revolution is sanctioned. An august national assembly shall make the constitution, and neither foreign pandour, domestic triumvirate with levelled cannon, Guy Fawkes powder plots, for that too was spoken of, nor any tyrannic power on the earth or under the earth shall say to it, What dost thou? So jubilates the people, sure now of a constitution. Cracked Marquis saint Rouge is heard under the windows of the chateau, murmuring sheer speculative treason. End of Book 5, Chapter 8《The French Revolution: A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume One, Book Five, The Third Estate, Chapter Nine, The Lantern. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan, Book Five, Chapter Nine, The Lantern. The fall of the Bastille may be said to have shaken all France to the deepest foundations of its existence. The rumour of these wonders flies everywhere, with a natural speed of rumour, with an effect thought to be preternatural, produced by plots. Did Dorleon or Laclos, nay, did Mirabeau, not overburdened with money at this time, send riding couriers out from Paris to gallop on all radii or highways towards all points of France? It is a miracle which no penetrating man will call in question. Already in most towns electoral committees were met to regret Necker in harangue and resolution. In many a town as Rennes, Caen, Lyon, an ebullient people was already regretting him in brickbats and musketry. But now at every town's end in France there do arrive in these days of terror men as men will arrive, nay men on horseback since rumour oftenest travels riding. These men declare, with alarmed countenance, the brigands to be coming, to be just at hand, and do then ride on about their further business, be what it might. Whereupon the whole population of such town defensively flies to arms. Petition is soon thereafter forwarded to National Assembly. In such peril and terror of peril, leave to organise yourself cannot be withheld. The armed population becomes everywhere an enrolled National Guard. Thus rides rumour, careering along all radii from Paris outwards to such purpose. In few days, some say in not many hours, all France to the utmost borders bristles with bayonets. Singular, but undeniable, miraculous or not. But thus may any chemical liquid, though cooled to the freezing point or far lower, still continue liquid, and then, on the slightest stroke or shake, it at once rushes wholly into ice. Thus has France for long months and even years been chemically dealt with, brought below zero, and now, shaken by the fall of a Bastille, it instantaneously congeals into one crystallised mass of sharp-cutting steel. Goya la tocca! Where? Who touches it? In Paris, an electoral committee with a new mayor and general is urgent with belligerent workmen to resume their handicrafts. Strong dames of the market, Dame de la Haule, demit congratulatory harangues, present bouquets to the shrine of Saint Genevieve. Unenrolled men deposit their arms, not so readily as could be wished, and receive nine francs. With tediums, royal visits and sanctioned revolution, there is halcyon weather, weather even of preternatural brightness, the hurricane being overblown. Nevertheless, as is natural, the waves still run high, hollow rocks retaining their murmur. We are but at the 22nd of the month, hardly above a week since the Bastille fell, when it suddenly appears that old Foulon is alive. Nay, that he is here in early morning in the streets of Paris, the extortioner, the plotter who would make the people eat grass and was a liar from the beginning. It is even so. 
the deceptive sumptuous funeral of some domestic that died, the hiding place at Vitry towards Fontainebleau, have not availed that wretched old man. Some living domestic or dependent, for none loves Foulon, has betrayed him to the village. Merciless boars of Vitry unearth him, pounce on him like hellhounds. Westward old infamy, to Paris to be judged at the Hôtel de Ville. His old head, which seventy-four years have bleached, is bare. They have tied an emblematic bundle of grass on his back. A garland of nettles and thistles is round his neck. In this manner, led with ropes, goaded on with curses and menaces, must he, with his old limbs, sprawl forward, the pitiablest, most unpitied of all old men. Sooty Saint Antoine and every street mustering its crowds as he passes. The Place de Grave, the hall of the Hôtel de Ville, will scarcely hold his escort and him. Foulon must not only be judged righteously, but judged there where he stands, without any delay. Appoint seven judges, ye municipals, or seventy and seven. Name them yourselves, or we will name them, but judge him. Electoral rhetoric, eloquence of Mayor Bailly, is wasted explaining the beauty of the law's delay. Delay, and still delay. Behold, O Mayor of the people, the morning has worn itself into noon, and he is still unjudged. Lafayette, pressingly sent for, arrives, gives voice. This Foulon, a known man, is guilty almost beyond doubt, but may he not have accomplices? Ought not the truth to be cunningly pumped out of him in the Abbe prison? It is a new light. Saint Colotism claps hands, at which hand-clapping Foulon, in his feignness as his destiny would have it, also claps. See, they understand one another, cries dark Saint Colotism, blazing into fury of suspicion. Friends, said a person in good clothes, stepping forward, what is the use of judging this man? Has he not been judged these thirty years? With wild yells, Saint Colotism clutches him in its hundred hands. He is whirled across the Place de Grève to the lantern, lamp iron, which there is at the corner of the Rue de la Vannerie, pleading bitterly for life to the deaf winds. Only with the third rope, for two ropes broke and a quavering voice still pleaded, can he be so much as got hanged. His body is dragged through the streets. His head goes aloft on a pike, the mouth filled with grass, amid sounds as of Tophet from a grass-eating people. Surely if revenge is a kind of justice, it is a wild kind. O oh, mad sense colotism, hast thou risen in thy mad darkness, in thy soot and rags, unexpectedly like an Enceladus living buried from under his trinacria? They that would make grass be eaten do now eat grass in this manner? After long dumb groaning generations has the turn suddenly become thine to such abysmal overturns and frightful instantaneous inversions of the centre of gravity are human solecisms all liable if they but knew it the more liable the falser and top heavier they are. To add to the horror of Merbailly and his municipals word comes that Berthier has also been arrested that he is on his way hither from Compiègne. Bertier and Tendon, say, tax levier of Paris, sycophant and tyrant, forestaller of corn, contriver of camps against the people, accused of many things. Is he not Foulon's son-in-law, and in that one point guilty of all? In these hours, too, when sans colotism has its blood up, the shuddering municipal send one of their number to escort him with mounted national guards. At the fall of day, the wretched Bertier, still wearing a face of courage, arrives at the barrier in an open carriage, with the municipal beside him, five hundred horsemen with drawn sabres, unarmed footmen enough, not without noise. Placards go brandished round him, bearing legibly his indictment as sans colotism with unlegal brevity, in huge letters, draws it up. Paris has come forth to meet him with hand clappings, with windows flung up, with dances, triumph songs as of the Furies. Lastly, the head of Foulon, this also meets him on a pike. Well might his look become glazed and sense fail him at such sight. Nevertheless, be the man's conscience what it may, his nerves are of iron. At the Hôtel de Ville he will answer nothing. 
he says, he obeyed superior ordered. They have his papers, they may judge and determine as for himself, not having closed an eye these two nights, he demands before all things to have sleep. Leaden sleep, thou miserable Batier. Guards rise with him in motion towards the abbey. At the very door of the Hôtel de Ville they are clutched, flung asunder as by a vortex of mad arms. Bertier whirls towards the lantern. He snatches a musket, fells and strikes, defending himself like a mad lion, is borne down, trampled, hanged, mangled. His head too, and even his heart, flies over the city on a pike. Horrible in lands that had known equal justice. Not so unnatural in lands that had never known it. Le sang qui coule est-il donc si pur? asked Barnave, intimating that the gallows, though by irregular methods, has its own. Thou thyself, O reader, when thou turnest that corner of the Rue de la Vanerie and discernest still that same grim bracket of old iron, will not want for reflections. Over a grocer's shop, or otherwise, with a bust of Louis Fourteenth in the niche under it, or now no longer in the niche, it still sticks out there, still holding out an ineffectual light of fish oil, and has seen worlds wrecked, and says nothing. But to the eye of unenlightened patriotism, what a thunder cloud was this, suddenly shaping itself in the radiance of the halcyon weather. Cloud of Erebus blackness, betokening latent electricity without limit. Mayor Bailly, General Lafayette, throw up their commissions in an indignant manner, need to be flattered back again. The cloud disappears as thunder clouds do. The halcyon weather returns, though of a greyer complexion, of a character more and more evidently not supernatural. Thus, in any case, with what rub soever, shall the Bastille be abolished from our earth, and with it feudalism, despotism, and, one hopes, scoundrelism generally, and all hard usage of man by his brother man. Alas, the scoundrelism and hard usage are not so easy of abolition. But as for the Bastille, it sinks day after day and month after month, its ashlars and boulders tumbling down continually by express order of our municipals. Crowds of the curious roam through its caverns, gaze on the skeletons found walled up, on the oubliettes, iron cages, monstrous stone blocks with padlocked chains. One day we discern Mirabeau there, along with Genevese Dumont. Workers and onlookers make reverent way for him, fling verses, flowers on his path, Bastille papers and curiosities into his carriage with vivats. Able editors compile books from the Bastille archives, from what of them remain unburnt. The key of that robber den shall cross the Atlantic, shall lie on Washington's hall table. The great clock ticks now in a private patriotic clockmaker's apartment, no longer measuring hours of mere heaviness. Vanished is the Bastille, or what we call vanished, the body or sandstone of it hanging in benign metamorphosis for centuries to come over the Seine waters, as Pont Louis says, the soul of it living, perhaps still longer, in the memories of men. So far, ye august senators, with your tennis court oaths, your inertia and impetus, your sagacity and pertinacity, have ye brought us. And yet think, messieurs, as the petitioner justly urged, you who were our saviours did yourselves need saviours. The brave Bastilliers, namely workmen of Paris, many of them in straitened pecuniary circumstances. Subscriptions are opened, lists are formed, more accurate than Ailey's, harangues are delivered. A body of Bastille heroes, tolerably complete, did get together, comparable to the Argonauts, hoping to endure like them. But in little more than a year the whirlpool of things threw them asunder again, and they sank. So many highest superlatives achieved by man are followed by new higher, and dwindle into comparatives and positives. The siege of the Bastille, weighed with which in the historical balance most other sieges, including that of Troy Town, a gossamer, cost, as we find, in killed and mortally wounded on the part of the besiegers, some eighty-three persons. On the part of the besieged, after all that straw-burning, fire-pumping and deluge of musketry, 
One poor solitary invalid, shot stone dead, ride mort on the battlements. The Bastille fortress, like the city of Jericho, was overturned by miraculous sound. End of Book 5, Chapter 9《The French Revolution A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1. Book 6 Consolidation. Chapter 1 Make the Constitution. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 6, Chapter 1 Make the Constitution. Here perhaps is the place to fix a little more precisely what these two words, French Revolution, shall mean. For, strictly considered, they may have as many meanings as there are speakers of them. All things are in revolution, in change from moment to moment, which becomes sensible from epoch to epoch. In this time world of ours there is probably nothing else but revolution and mutation, and even nothing else conceivable. Revolution, you answer, means speedier change. Whereupon one has still to ask, how speedy? At what degree of speed, in what particular points of this variable course, which varies in velocity but can never stop till time itself stops, does revolution begin and end, cease to be ordinary mutation, and again become such? It is a thing that will depend on definition, more or less arbitrary. For ourselves, we answer that French Revolution means here the open, violent rebellion and victory of disimprisoned anarchy against corrupt, worn-out authority. How anarchy breaks prison, bursts up from the infinite deep, and rages uncontrollable, immeasurable, enveloping a world, in faces after faces of fever frenzy, till the frenzy burning itself out, and what elements of new order it held, since all force holds such, developing themselves, the uncontrollable begot, if not re-imprisoned, yet harnessed, and its mad forces made to work towards their object as sane, regulated ones. For as hierarchies and dynasties of all kinds, theocracies, aristocracies, autocracies, strumpetocracies, have ruled over the world, so it was appointed in the decrees of providence that this same victorious anarchy, Jacobinism, Sanscalotism, French Revolution, horrors of French Revolution, or what else mortals name it, should have its turn. The destructive wrath of Sanscalotism, this is what we speak, having unhappily no voice for singing. Surely a great phenomenon, nay, it is a transcendental one, overstepping all rules and experience, the crowning phenomenon of our modern time. For here again, most unexpectedly, comes antique fanaticism in new and newest vesture, miraculous as all fanaticism is. Call it the fanaticism of making away with formulas, de humeur les fumules. The world of formulas, the formed regular world, which all habitable world is, must needs hate such fanaticism like death, and be at deadly variance with it. The world of formulas must conquer it, or failing that, must die execrating it, anathematizing it, can nevertheless in no wise prevent its being and its having been. The anathemas are there, and the miraculous thing is there. Whence it cometh? Whither it goeth? These are questions. When the age of miracles lay faded into the distance as an incredible tradition, and even the age of conventionalities was now old, and man's existence had for long generations rested on mere formulas which were grown hollow by course of time, and it seemed as if no reality any longer existed but only phantasms of realities, and God's universe were the work of the tailor and upholsterer mainly, and men were buckram masks that went about becking and grimacing there, on a sudden, the earth yawns asunder, and amid Tartarian smoke and glare of fierce brightness, rises Sanscalotism, many-headed fire-breathing, and asks, What think ye of me? Well, may the buckram masks start together, terror-struck, into expressive, well-concerted groups. It is indeed, friends, a most singular, most fatal thing. Let whosoever is but buckram and a phantasm look to it, ill verily may it fare with him. Here methinks he cannot much longer be. 
Woe also to many a one who is not wholly buckram, but partially real and human. The age of miracles has come back. Behold the world phoenix in fire consummation and fire creation. Wide are her fanning wings, loud is her death melody of battle thunders and falling towns. Skyward lashes the funeral flame enveloping all things. It is the death birth of a world. Whereby, however, as we often say, shall one unspeakable blessing seem attainable. This, namely, that man and his life rest no more on hollowness and a lie, but on solidity and some kind of truth. Welcome the beggarliest truth, so it may be one, in exchange for the royalist sham. Truth of any kind breeds ever new and better truth. Thus hard granite rock will crumble down into soil under the blessed skyey influences and cover itself with verdure, with fruitage and umbrage. But as for falsehood, which in like contrary manner grows ever falser, what can it or what should it do but decease, being ripe, decompose itself gently or even violently and return to the father of it, too probably in flames of fire? Sanscolotism will burn much, but what is incombustible it will not burn. Fear not, Sanscolotism. Recognise it for what it is, the portentous, inevitable end of much, the miraculous beginning of much. One other thing thou mayest understand of it, that it too came from God, for has it not been? From of old, as it is written, are his goings forth in the great deep of things. Fearful and wonderful now as in the beginning, in the whirlwind also he speaks, and the wrath of men is made to praise him. But to gauge and measure this immeasurable thing, and what is called account for it, and reduce it to a dead logic formula, attempt not. Much less shalt thou shriek thyself hoarse, cursing it, for that to all needful lengths has been already done. As an actually existing son of time, look with unspeakable manifold interest, oftenest in silence, at what time did bring. Therewith edify, instruct, nourish thyself, or were it but to amuse and gratify thyself as it is given thee. Another question which at every new turn will rise on us, requiring ever new reply, is this. Where the French Revolution specially is... In the king's palace, in his majesty's or her majesty's managements and maltreatments, cabals, imbecilities and woes, answer some few, whom we do not answer. In the national assembly, answer a large mixed multitude who accordingly seat themselves in the reporter's chair and therefrom noting what proclamations, acts, reports, passages of logic fence, bursts of parliamentary eloquence seem notable within doors and what tumults and rumours of tumult become audible from without, produce volume on volume and naming it History of the French Revolution contentedly publish the same to do the like, to almost any extent, with so many filed newspapers, choix des rapports, histoire parlementaire as there are, amounting to many horse-loads, were easy for us. Easy, but unprofitable. The National Assembly, named now Constituent Assembly, goes its course, making the Constitution. But the French Revolution also goes its course. In general, may we not say that the French Revolution lies in the heart and head of every violent speaking, of every violent thinking French man. How the 25 millions of such in their perplexed combination, acting and counteracting, may give birth to events, which event successively is the cardinal one, and from what point of vision it may best be surveyed, this is a problem. Which problem, the best insight, seeking light from all possible sources, shifting its point of vision, whithersoever vision or glimpse of vision can be had, may employ itself in solving and be well content to solve in some tolerably approximate way. As to the National Assembly, in so far as it still towers eminent over France after the manner of a carbon caroccio, though now no longer in the van, and rings signals for retreat or to advance, it is and continues a reality, among other realities. 
But insofar as it sits making the constitution, on the other hand, it is a fatuity and chimera mainly. Alas, in the never-so-heroic building of Montesquieu Marbley card castles, though shouted over by the world, what interest is there? Occupied in that way, an august National Assembly becomes for us little other than a Sanhedrin of pedants, not of the gerund grinding, yet of no fruitfuller sort, and its loud debatings and recriminations about rights of man, rights of peace and war, veto suspensive, veto absolute, what are they but so many pedants curses? May God confound you for your theory of irregular verbs. A constitution can be built, constitutions in our fallacier, but the frightful difficulty is that of getting men to come and live in them. Could C.A. have drawn thunder and lightning out of heaven to sanction his constitution, it had been well, but without any thunder? Nay, strictly considered, is it not still true that without some such celestial sanction, given visibly in thunder or invisibly otherwise, no constitution can in the long run be worth much more than the waste paper it is written on? The constitution, the set of laws or prescribed habits of acting that men will live under, is the one which images their convictions, their faith as to this wondrous universe and what rights, duties, capabilities they have there, which stands sanctioned, therefore, by necessity itself, if not by a seen deity, then by an unseen one. Other laws, whereof there are always enough ready-made, are usurpations which men do not obey, but rebel against and abolish by their earliest convenience. The question of questions accordingly were, who is it that especially for rebellers and abolishers can make a constitution? He that can image forth the general belief when there is one, that can impart one when, as here, there is none. A most rare man, ever as of older God-missioned man, here, however, in defect of such transcendent supreme man, time, with its infinite succession of merely superior men, each yielding his little contribution, does much. Force, likewise, for as antiquarian philosophers teach, the royal sceptre was from the first something of a hammer to crack such heads as could not be convinced, will all along find somewhat to do. And thus, in perpetual abolition and reparation, rending and mending, with struggle and strife, with present evil and the hope and effort towards future good, must the Constitution, as all human beings do, build itself forward or unbuild itself and sink as it can and may. O oh, C.A. and ye other committee men and twelve hundred miscellaneous individuals from all parts of France, what is the belief of France and yours if ye knew it? Properly, that there shall be no belief that all formulas be swallowed, the constitution which will suit that? Alas, too clearly, a no constitution, an anarchy, which also, in due season, shall be vouchsafed you. But, after all, what can an unfortunate National Assembly do? Consider only this, that there are 1,200 miscellaneous individuals, not a unit of whom but has his own thinking apparatus, his own speaking apparatus. In every unit of them is some belief and wish, different for each, both that France should be regenerated and also that he individually should do it. 1,200 separate forces, yoked miscellaneously to any object, miscellaneously to all sides of it, and bid pull for life. Or... Is it the nature of national assemblies generally to do, with endless labour and clangour, nothing? Are representative governments mostly at bottom tyrannies too? Shall we say the tyrants, the ambitious, contentious persons from all corners of the country do, in this manner, get gathered into one place, and there, with motion and counter-motion, with jargon and hubbub, cancel one another like the fabulous Kilkenny cats, and produce for net result zero? The country, meanwhile, governing or guiding itself by such wisdom, recognised or for the most part unrecognised, as may exist in individual heads here and there. Nay, even that were a great improvement, for of old, with their Guelph factions and Ghibelline factions, with their red roses and white roses, they were wont to cancel the whole country as well. 
Besides, they do it now in a much narrower cockpit within the four walls of their assembly house, and here and there an outpost of hustings and barrel heads. Do it with tongues too, not with swords, all which improvements in the art of producing zero. Are they not great? Nay, best of all, some happy continents, as the western one with its savannas, where whosoever has four willing limbs finds food under his feet and an infinite sky over his head, can do without governing. What sphinx questions, which the distracted world in these very generations must answer or die? End of Book 6, Chapter 1《The French Revolution: A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume One, Book Six, Consolidation, Chapter Two, The Constituent Assembly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan, Book Six, Chapter Two, The Constituent Assembly. One thing an elected assembly of twelve hundred is fit for: destroying which indeed is but a more decided exercise of its natural talent for doing nothing. Do nothing, only keep agitating, debating, and things will destroy themselves. So, and not otherwise, proved it with an august National Assembly. It took the name Constituent, as if its mission and function had been to construct or build, which also, with its whole soul, it endeavoured to do. Yet, in the fates and the nature of things, there lay for it, precisely of all functions, the most opposite to that. Singular, what Gospels men will believe, even Gospels according to Jean-Jacques. It was the fixed faith of these national deputies, as of all thinking Frenchmen, that the Constitution could be made, that they there and then were called to make it. How, with the toughness of old Hebrews or Ishmaelite Moslem, did the otherwise light, unbelieving people persist in this their credo, quia impossibile, and front the armed world with it, and grow fanatic and even heroic, and do exploits by it? The Constituent Assembly's constitution, and several others will, being printed and not manuscript, survive to future generations as an instructive, well-nigh incredible document of the time the most significant picture of the then existing France, or, at lowest, picture of these men's picture of it. But in truth and seriousness, what could the National Assembly have done? The thing to be done was, actually, as they said, to regenerate France, to abolish the old France and make a new one, quietly or forcibly, by concession or by violence. This, by the law of nature, has become inevitable. With what degree of violence depends on the wisdom of those that preside over it. With perfect wisdom on the part of the National Assembly it had all been otherwise, but whether in any wise it could have been pacific, nay, other than bloody and convulsive, may still be a question. Grant, meanwhile, that this constituent assembly does, to the last, continue to be something. With a sigh, it sees itself incessantly forced away from its infinite divine task of perfecting the theory of irregular verbs to finite terrestrial tasks, which latter have still a significance for us. It is the cynosure of revolutionary France, this National Assembly. All work of government has fallen into its hands or under its control. All men look to it for guidance. In the middle of that huge revolt of twenty-five millions, it hovers always aloft as carroccio or battle standard, impelling and impelled in the most confused way. If it cannot give much guidance, it will still seem to give some. It emits pacifatory proclamations, not a few, with more or with less result. It authorises the enrolment of National Guards, lest brigands come to devour us and reap the unripe crops. It sends missions to quell effervescences, to deliver men from the lantern. It can listen to congratulatory addresses which arrive daily by the sackful, mostly in Kim Cambyses' vein, also to petitions and complaints from all mortals, so that every mortal's complaint, if it cannot get redressed, may at least hear itself complain. For the rest, an august National Assembly can produce parliamentary eloquence and appoint committees, committees of the Constitution, of reports, of researches, and of much else, 
which again yield mountains of printed paper. The theme of new parliamentary eloquence in bursts or in plenty of smooth flowing floods. And so, from the waste vortex whereon all things go whirling and grinding, organic laws or the similitude of such slowly emerge. With endless debating, we get the rights of man written down and promulgated, true paper basis of all paper constitutions. Neglecting, cry the opponents, to declare the duties of man. Forgetting, answer we, to ascertain the mights of man, one of the fatalist omissions. Nay, sometimes, as on the 4th of August, our National Assembly, fired suddenly by an almost preternatural enthusiasm, will get through whole masses of work in one night. A memorable night this 4th of August. Dignitaries temporal and spiritual, peers, archbishops, parliaments, presidents, each outdoing the other in patriotic devotedness, come successively to throw their untenable possessions on the altar of the fatherland. With louder and louder vivats, for indeed it is after dinner too, they abolish tithes, seigneurial dues, gabel, excessive preservation of game, nay, privilege, immunity, feudalism, root and branch, then appoint a tedium for it. And so finally disperse about three in the morning, striking the stars with their sublime heads. Such night, unforeseen but forever memorable, was this the 4th of August, 1789. Miraculous, or semi-miraculous, some seem to think it. A new night of Pentecost, shall we say, shaped according to the new time and new church of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. It had its causes, also its effects. In such manner labour the national deputies, perfecting their theory of irregular verbs, governing France and being governed by it, with toil and noise, cutting asunder ancient intolerable bonds and, for new ones, assiduously spinning ropes of sand. Were their labours a nothing or a something, yet the eyes of all France being reverently fixed on them, history can never very long leave them altogether out of sight. For the present, if we glance into that assembly hall of theirs, it will be found, as is natural, most irregular. As many as a hundred members are on their feet at once, no rule in making motions, or only commencements of a rule. Spectators' gallery allowed to applaud, and even to hiss. President appointed once a fortnight, raising many times no serene head above the waves. Nevertheless, as in all human assemblages, like does begin arranging itself to like. The perennial rule, ubi homines sunt modis sunt, proves valid. Rudiments of methods disclose themselves, rudiments of parties. There is a right side, côté droit, a left side, côté gauche, sitting on Monsieur le Président's right hand or on his left. The côté droit, conservative, the côté gauche, destructive. Intermediate is Anglo-Maniac constitutionalism or two-chamber royalism with its mouniers, its lallies, fast verging towards non-entity. Preeminent on the right side, pleads and perorates Casales, the dragoon captain, eloquent, mildly fervent, earning for himself the shadow of a name. There also blusters Barrel Mirabeau, the younger Mirabeau, not without wit. Dusky Despremenil does nothing but sniff and ejaculate. Might, it is fondly thought, lay prostrate the elder Mirabeau himself, would he but try, which he does not. Last and greatest, see, for one moment, the Abbe Mori, with his Jesuitic eye, his impassive brass face, image of all the cardinal sins. Indomitable, unquenchable, he fights Jesuitico rhetorically, with toughest lungs and heart, for throne, especially for altar and tithes. So that a shrill voice exclaims once from the gallery, Monsieur of the clergy, you have to be shaved. If you wriggle too much, you will get cut. The left side is also called the Delion side, and sometimes, derisively, the Palais Royal. And yet, so confused, real imaginary, seems everything, it is doubtful, as Mirabeau said, whether Dorleon himself belonged to that same Dorleon party. What can be known and seen is that his moon visage doth beam forth from that point of space. There likewise sits sea-green Robespierre, 
throwing in his light weight with decision, not yet with effect. A thin, lean Puritan and Precisian, he would make away with formulas, yet lives, moves, and has his being wholly in formulas of another sort. Purple, such according to Robespierre, ought to be the royal method of propagating laws. Purple, this is the law I have framed for thee. Dost thou accept it? Answered the right side from centre and left by inextinguishable laughter. Yet men of insight discern that the sea green may by chance go far. This man, observes Mirabeau, will do somewhat. He believes every word he says. ABCA is busy with mere constitutional work, wherein unlucky fellow workmen are less pliable than, with one who has completed the science of polity, they ought to be. Courage, CA, nevertheless, some twenty months of heroic travail, of contradiction from the stupid, and the constitution shall be built, the top stone of it brought out with shouting, say, rather, the top paper, for it is all paper, and thou hast done in it what the earth or the heaven could require thy utmost. Note likewise this trio, memorable for several things. Memorable were it only that their history is written in an epigram. Whatsoever these three have in hand, it is said, Duport thinks it, Barnave speaks it, Lameth does it. But Royal Mirabeau? Conspicuous among all parties, raised above and beyond them all, this man rises more and more. As we often say, he has an eye, he is a reality, while others are formulas and eyeglasses. In the transient he will detect the perennial, find some firm footing even among paper vortexes. His fame is gone forth to all lands. It gladdened the heart of the crabbed old friend of men himself before he died. The very postillions of inns have heard of Mirabeau. When an impatient traveller complains that the team is insufficient, his postillion answers, Yes, monsieur, the wheelers are weak, but my Mirabeau, main horse, you see, is a right one. Mais mon Mirabeau est excellent. And now, reader, thou shalt quit this noisy discrepancy of a national assembly, not if thou be of humane mind, without pity. Twelve hundred brother men are there in the centre of twenty-five millions, fighting so fiercely with fate and with one another, struggling their lives out as most sons of Adam do, for that which profiteth not. Nay, on the whole, it is admitted further to be very dull. Dull as this day's assembly, said someone. Why date? Pourquoi date? answered Mirabeau. Consider that they are twelve hundred, that they not only speak but read their speeches, and even borrow and steal speeches to read. With twelve hundred fluent speakers and their Noah's deluge of vociferous commonplace, unattainable silence may well seem the one blessing of life. But figure twelve hundred pamphleteers droning forth perpetual pamphlets, and no man to gag them. Neither, as in the American Congress, do the arrangements seem perfect, a senator has not his own desk and newspaper here. Of tobacco, much less of pipes, there is not the slightest provision. Conversation itself must be transacted in a low tone with continual interruption. Only pencil notes circulate freely, in incredible numbers, to the foot of the very tribune. Such work is it, regenerating a nation, perfecting one's theory of irregular verbs. End of Book 6, Chapter 3« The French Revolution, A History» by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 6, Consolidation Chapter 3, The General Overturn This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 6, Chapter 3, The General Overturn Of the King's Court, for the present, there is almost nothing whatever to be said. Silent, deserted are these halls. Royalty languishes, forsaken of its war-god and all its hopes, till once the Oie de Boeuf rally again. The sceptre is departed from King Louis. He has gone over to the Salle des Menus, to the Paris Town Hall, or one knows not whither. In the July days, while all ears were yet deafened by the crash of the Bastille, and ministers and princes were scattered to the four winds, it seemed as if the very valets had grown heavy of hearing. 
Besson Bar, also in flight towards infinite space, but hovering a little at Versailles, was addressing His Majesty personally for an order about post-horses, when, lo, the valet-in-waiting places himself familiarly between His Majesty and me, stretching out his rascal neck to learn what it was. His Majesty, in sudden collar, whirled round, made a clutch at the tongs. I gently prevented him. He grasped my hand in thankfulness, and I noticed tears in his eyes. Poor king, for French kings also are men. Louis XIV himself once clutched the tongs and even smote with them, but then it was at Louvois and Dame Maintenon ran up. The queen sits weeping in her inner apartments, surrounded by weak women. She is at the height of unpopularity, universally regarded as the evil genius of France. Her friends and familiar counsellors have all fled, and fled surely on the foolishest errand. The Chateau Polignac still frowns aloft on its bold and enormous cubical rock amid the blue girdling mountains of Auvergne. But no Duke and Duchess Polignac look forth from it. They have fled. They have met Necker at Baal. They shall not return. That France should see her nobles resist the irresistible, inevitable, with the face of angry men, was unhappy, not unexpected, but with the face and sense of pettish children? This was her peculiarity. They understood nothing, would understand nothing. Does not at this hour a new Polignac, first born of these two, sit reflective in the castle of Ham, in an astonishment he will never recover from, the most confused of existing mortals? King Louis has his new ministry. Mere popularities, old President Pompignon, Necker come back in triumph and others such. But what will it avail him? As was said, the sceptre, all but the wooden gilt sceptre, had departed elsewhither. Volition, determination, is not in this man, only innocence, indolence, dependence on all persons but himself, on all circumstances but the circumstances he were lord of. So troublous internally is our Versailles and its work. Beautiful, if seen from afar, resplendent like a sun, seen near at hand, a mere sun's atmosphere, hiding darkness, confused ferment of ruin. But over France there goes on the indisputablest destruction of formulas, transaction of realities that follow therefrom. So many millions of persons, all jived and nigh strangled with formulas, whose life nevertheless, at least the digestion and hunger of it, was real enough. Heaven has at length sent an abundant harvest, but what profits it the poor man when earth with her formulas interposes? Industry, in these times of insurrection, must needs lie dormant, capital, as usual, not circulating, but stagnating timorously in nooks. The poor man is short of work, is therefore short of money. Nay, even had he money, bread is not to be bought for it. Were it plotting of aristocrats, plotting of Dorleon, were it brigands, preternatural terror, and the clang of Phoebus Apollo's silver bow, enough, the markets are scarce of grain, plentiful only in tumult. Farmers seem lazy to thresh, being either bribed, or needing no bribe, with prices ever rising, with perhaps rent itself no longer so pressing. Neither, what is singular, do municipal enactments, that along with so many measures of which you shall sell so many of rye, and other the like, much mend the matter. Dragoons with drawn swords stand ranked among the corn sacks, often more dragoons than sacks. Meal mobs abound, growing into mobs of still darker quality. Starvation has been known among the French commonality before this, known and familiar. Did we not see them in the year 1775, presenting in sallow faces, in wretchedness and raggedness, their petition of grievances, and for answer, getting a brand new gallows, forty feet high? Hunger and darkness through long years. For look back on that earlier Paris riot when a great personage worn out by debauchery was believed to be in want of blood baths, and mothers in worn raiment yet with living hearts under it filled the public places with their wild Rachel cries, stilled also by the gallows. 
twenty years ago, the friend of men, preaching to the deaf, described the limousin peasants as wearing a pain-stricken, souffre douleur look, a look past complaint, as if the oppression of the great were like the hail and the thunder, a thing irremediable, the ordinance of nature. And now... If in some great hour the shock of a falling Bastille should awaken you, and it were found to be the ordinance of art merely, and remediable, reversible? Or has the reader forgotten that flood of savages which, in sight of the same friend of men, descended from the mountain at Mont d'Or? Lank-haired, haggard faces, shapes raw-boned in high sabots, in woollen jupes with leather girdles studded with copper nails— they rocked from foot to foot and beat time with their elbows too as the quarrel and battle which was not long in beginning went on, shouting fiercely, the lank faces distorted into the similitude of a cruel laugh. For they were darkened and hardened long had they been the prey of excisemen and taxmen, of clerks with the cold spurt of their pen. It was the fixed prophecy of our old Marquis, which no man would listen to, that such government, by blind man's buff, stumbling along too far, would end by the general overturn, the culbut general. No man would listen. Each went his thoughtless way. And time and destiny also travelled on. The government, by blind man's buff, stumbling along, has reached the precipice inevitable for it. Dull drudgery, driven on by clerks with the cold, dastard spurt of their pen, has been driven into a communion of drudges. For now, moreover, there have come the strangest, confused tidings. By Paris journals, with their paper wings, or still more portentous, where no journals are, by rumour and conjecture, oppression not inevitable, a Bastille prostrate, and the Constitution fast getting ready. Which constitution, if it be something and not nothing, what can it be but bread to eat? The traveller, walking up hill, bridle in hand, overtakes a poor woman. The image, as such commonly are, of drudgery and scarcity, looking sixty years of age, though she is not yet twenty-eight. They have seven children, her poor drudge and she, a farm with one cow which helps to make the children's soup. Also one little horse or garron. They have rents and quit rents, hens to pay to this seigneur, oat sacks to that, king's taxes, statute labour, church taxes, taxes enough, and think the times inexpressible. She has heard that somewhere, in some manner, something is to be done for the poor. God send it soon, for the dues and taxes crush us down. Nous écrasons. Fair prophecies are spoken, but they are not fulfilled. There have been notables, assemblages, turnings out and comings in, intriguing and manoeuvring, parliamentary eloquence and arguing, Greek meeting Greek in high places has long gone on, yet still bread comes not. The harvest is reaped and garnered, yet still we have no bread. Urged by despair and by hope, what can drudgery do but rise, as predicted, and produce the general overturn? Fancy, then, some five full-grown millions of such gaunt figures, with their haggard faces, figure halve, in woollen jupes, with copper-studded leather girths and high sabots, starting up to ask, as in forest roarings their washed upper classes, after long unreviewed centuries, virtually, this question, How have ye treated us? How have ye taught us, fed us, and led us, while we toiled for you? The answer can be read in flames over the nightly summer sky. This is the feeding and leading we have had of you, emptiness of pocket, of stomach, of head, and of heart. Behold, there is nothing in us, nothing but what nature gives her wild children of the desert, ferocity and appetite, strength grounded on hunger. Did ye mark among your rights of men that man was not to die of starvation while there was bread reaped by him? It is among the mites of man. Seventy-two chateaux have flamed aloft in the Maconnais and Beaujolais alone. This seems the centre of the conflagration, but it has spread over Dauphine, Alsace, the Lyonnais. The whole southeast is in a blaze. All over the north, from Rouen to Metz, disorder is abroad. 
Smugglers of salt go openly in armed bands. The barriers of towns are burnt. Toll gatherers, tax gatherers, official persons put to flight. It was thought, says Young, the people from hunger would revolt. And we see they have done it. Desperate lackles, long prowling aimless, now finding hope in desperation itself, everywhere form a nucleus. They ring the church bell by way of toxin, and the parish turns out to the work. Ferocity, atrocity, hunger and revenge, such work as we can imagine. Ill stands it now with the seigneur who, for example, has walled up the only fountain of the township, who has ridden high on his charter and parchments, who has preserved game not wisely but too well. Churches also and canonries are sacked without mercy which have shorn the flock too close for getting to feed it. Woe to the land over which sans colotism in its day of vengeance tramps roughshod, shod in sabbats. High-bred seigneurs with their delicate women and little ones had to fly half-naked under cloud of night, glad to escape the flames and even worse. You meet them at the table d'hôte of inns, making wise reflections or foolish that rank is destroyed, uncertain whether they shall now wend. The maitea will find it convenient to be slack in paying rent. As for the tax-gatherer, he, long hunting as a biped of prey, may now get hunted as one. His Majesty's exchequer will not fill up the deficit this season. It is the notion of many that a patriot Majesty, being the restorer of French liberty, has abolished most taxes, though for their private ends some men make a secret of it. Where this will end? In the abyss one may prophesy whither all delusions are at all moments travelling where this delusion has now arrived. For if there be a faith from of old, it is this, as we often repeat, that no lie can live for ever. The very truth has to change its vesture from time to time and be born again. But all lies have sentence of death written down against them, and heaven's chancery itself, and slowly or fast advance incessantly towards their hour. The sign of a grand seigneur being landlord, says the vehement plain-spoken Arthur Young, are wastes, lands, deserts, ling. Go to his residence, you will find it in the middle of a forest, peopled with deer, wild boars and wolves. The fields are scenes of pitiable management, as the houses are of misery. To see so many millions of hands that would be industrious, all idle and starving. Oh, if I were legislator of France for one day, I would make these great lords skip again. Oh, Arthur, thou now actually beholdest them skip. Wilt thou grow to grumble at that too? For long years and generations it lasted, but the time came. Feather brain, whom no reasoning and no pleading could touch, the glare of the firebrand had to illuminate. There remained but that method. Consider it, look at it. The widow is gathering nettles for her children's dinner. A perfumed seigneur, delicately lounging in the oeil de boeuf, has an alchemy whereby he will extract from her the third nettle and name it rent and law. Such an arrangement must end. Ought it? But, O oh, most fearful, is such an ending. Let those to whom God in his great mercy has granted time and space prepare another and milder one. To some it is a matter of wonder that the seigneurs did not do something to help themselves, say, combine and arm, for there were a hundred and fifty thousand of them, all violent enough. Unhappily, a hundred and fifty thousand, scattered over wide provinces, divided by mutual ill will, cannot combine. The highest seigneurs, as we have seen, had already emigrated, with a view of putting France to the blush. Neither are arms now the peculiar property of seigneurs, but of every mortal who has ten shillings wherewith to buy a second-hand firelock. Besides, those starving peasants, after all, have not four feet and claws that you could keep them down permanently in that manner. They are not even of black colour. They are mere unwashed seigneurs, and a seigneur too has human bowels. The seigneurs did what they could, enrolled in national guards, fled with shrieks complaining to heaven and earth. One seigneur, famed Meme of Quincy near Vesoul, invited all the rustics of his neighbourhood to a banquet, blew up his chateau and them with gunpowder, and instantaneously vanished, no man yet knows whither. Some half-dozen years after he came back, and demonstrated that it was by accident. 
nor are the authorities idle, though unluckily all authorities, municipalities and such like, are in the uncertain transitory state, getting regenerated from old monarchic to new democratic. No official yet knows clearly what he is. Nevertheless, mayors, old or new, do gather, marechauses, national guards, troops of the line, justice of the most summary sort is not wanting. The electoral committee of Masson, though but a committee, goes the length of hanging, for its own behoof, as many as twenty. The prévot of Dauphiné traverses the country with a movable column, with tipstaves, gallows ropes, for gallows any tree will serve, and suspend its culprit, or thirteen culprits. Unhappy country! How is the fair gold and green of the ripe, bright year defaced with horrid blackness, black ashes of chateaus, black bodies of gibbeted men? Industry has ceased in it, not sounds of the hammer and saw, but of the tocsin and alarm drum. The sceptre has departed, whither one knows not, breaking itself in pieces, here impotent, there tyrannous. National guards are unskilful and of doubtful purpose. Soldiers are inclined to mutiny. There is danger that they too may quarrel, danger that they may agree. Strasbourg has seen riots, a town hall torn to shreds, its archives scattered white on the winds, drunk soldiers embracing drunk citizens for three days, and Mayor Dietrich and Marshal Rochambeau reduced night to desperation. Through the middle of all which phenomena is seen on his triumphant transit, escorted through Beaufort, for instance, by fifty national horsemen and all the military music of the place, Monsieur Necker, returning from Bâle. Glorious as the meridian, though poor Necker himself partly guesses whither it is leading. One highest culminating day at the Paris Town Hall, with immortal vivats, with wife and daughter kneeling publicly to kiss his hand, with Bessonval's pardon granted, but indeed revoked before sunset. One highest day, but then lower days, and even lower, down even to lowest. Such magic is in a name, and in the want of a name. Like some enchanted Mambrino's helmet, essential to victory comes this saviour of France, be shouted, be symboled by the world, alas so soon to be disenchanted, to be pitched shamefully over the lists as a barber's basin. Gibbon could wish to show him, in this ejected barber's basin state, to any man of solidity who were minded to have the soul burnt out of him and become a caput mortuum by ambition, unsuccessful or successful. Another small face, as we add, and no more. How, in the autumn months, our sharp-tempered Arthur has been pestered for some days past by shot, lead drops and slugs, rattling five or six times into my chaise and about my ears, all the mob of the country gone out to kill game. It is even so. On the cliffs of Dover, over all the marches of France, there appear this autumn two signs of the earth, emigrant flights of French seigneurs, emigrant winged flights of French game. Finished, one may say, or as good as finished, is the preservation of game on this earth, completed for endless time. What part it had to play in the history of civilization is played. Plaudite exeat. In this manner does sans colotism blaze up, illustrating many things, producing among the rest, as we saw on the 4th of August, that semi-miraculous night of Pentecost in the National Assembly, semi-miraculous which had its causes and its effects. Feudalism is struck dead, not on parchment only and by ink, but in very fact by fire, say, by self-combustion. This conflagration of the southeast will abate, will be got scattered to the west or elsewhere. Extinguish it will not, till the fuel be all done. End of Book 6, Chapter 3《The French Revolution: A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume One, Book Six, Consolidation, Chapter Four, in Q. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan, Book Six, Chapter Four, in Q. If we look now at Paris, one thing is too evident: that the bakers' shops have got their cues or tails, 
their long strings of purchases arranged in tail so that the first comes to be first served were the shop once open. This waiting in tail, not seen since the early days of July, again makes its appearance in August. In time we shall see it perfected by practice to the rank almost of an art, and the art or quasi-art of standing in tail become one of the characteristics of the Parisian people, distinguishing them from all other peoples whatsoever. But consider, while work itself is so scarce, how a man must not only realise money but stand waiting, if his wife is too weak to wait and struggle, for half days in the tail till he gets it changed for dear bad bread. Controversies to the length sometimes of blood and battery must arise in these exasperated queues. Or, if no controversy, then it is but one accordant pang lingua of complaint against the powers that be. France has begun her long curriculum of hungering, instructive and productive beyond academic curriculums, which extend over some seven most stressful years. As Jean-Paul says of his own life, to a great height shall the business of hungering go. Or consider, in strange contrast, the jubilee ceremonies. For in general, the aspect of Paris presents these two features, jubilee ceremonials and scarcity of victual. Processions enough walk in jubilee, of young women decked and dizened, their ribbons all trickler, moving with song and table to the shrine of Saint Genevieve to thank her that the Bastille is down. The strong men of the market and the strong women fail not with their bouquets and speeches. Abbe Fauchet, famed in such work, for Abbe Lefebvre could only distribute powder, blesses trickler cloth for the National Guard and makes it a national trickler flag, victorious, or to be victorious, in the cause of civil and religious liberty all over the world. Fouchet, we say, is the man for TDMs and public consecrations, to which, as in this instance of the flag, our National Guard will reply with volleys of musketry, church and cathedral though it be, filling Notre Dame with such noisiest, fuliginous amen, significant of several things. On the whole, we will say our new mayor, Bailly, our new commander, Lafayette, named also Scipio Americanus, have bought their preferment deer. Bailly rides in gilt state coach with beef-eaters and sumptuosity, Camille de Moulin and others sniffing at him for it. Scipio bestrides the white charger and waves with civic plumes in sight of all France. Neither of them, however, does it for nothing, but in truth at an exorbitant rate. At this rate, namely, of feeding Paris and keeping it from fighting. Out of the city fund, some 17,000 of the utterly destitute are employed digging on Montmartre a tenpence a day, which buys them at market price almost two pounds of bad bread. They look very yellow when Lafayette goes to harangue them. The town hall is in travail night and day. It must bring forth bread, a municipal constitution, regulation of all kinds, curbs on the sanscolotic press, above all bread, bread. Purveyors prowl the country far and wide with the appetite of lions, detect hidden grain, purchase open grain, by gentle means or forcible must and will find grain. A most thankless task and so difficult, so dangerous, even if a man did gain some trifle by it. On the 19th of August there is food for one day. Complaints there are that the food is spoiled and produces an effect on the intestines, not corn, but plaster of Paris. Which effect on the intestines, as well as that smarting in the throat and palate, a town hall proclamation warns you to disregard, and even to consider as drastic beneficial. The mayor of St. Denis, so black was his bread, has by a dyspeptic populace been hanged on the lantern there. National Guards protect the Paris corn market. First ten suffice, then six hundred. Busy are you, Bailly, Brissot de Vauville, Condorcet, and ye others? For, as just hinted, there is a municipal constitution to be made too. The old Bastille electors, after some ten days of psalmodying over their glorious victory, begin to hear it asked in a splenetic tone, Who put you there? They accordingly had to give place, not without moanings and audible growlings on both sides, to a new, larger body, specially elected for that post. 
which new body augmented, altered, then finally fixed at the number of 300 with the title of town representatives, representant de la commune, now sits there, rightly portioned into committees, assiduous, making a constitution at all moments when not seeking flower. And such a constitution, little short of miraculous, one that shall consolidate the revolution. The revolution is finished then? Thereby ye and all respectable friends of freedom would fain think so. Your revolution, like jelly sufficiently boiled, needs only to be poured into shapes of constitution and consolidated therein. Could it indeed contrive to cool, which last, however, is precisely the doubtful thing, or even the not doubtful? Unhappy friends of freedom consolidating a revolution. They must sit at work there, their pavilions spread on very chaos between two hostile worlds, the upper court world, the nether sans calotic one, and beaten on by both, toil painfully, perilously, doing in sad literal earnest the impossible. End of Book 6, Chapter 4《The French Revolution: A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume One, Book Six, Consolidation, Chapter Five, The Fourth Estate. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan, Book Six, Chapter Five, The Fourth Estate. Pamphleteering opens its abysmal throat wider and wider, never to close more. Our philosophes, indeed, rather withdraw after the manner of Marmontel, retiring in disgust the first day. Abbé Reynal, grown grey and quiet in his Marseille domicile, is little content with this work. The last literary act of the man will again be an act of rebellion, an indignant letter to the Constituent Assembly, answered by the order of the day. Thus also philosophe Morellet puckers discontented brows, being indeed threatened in his benefices by that 4th of August, it is clearly going too far. How astonishing that those haggard figures in woollen dupes would not rest as satisfied with speculation and victorious analysis as we. Ah, yes, speculation, philosophism, once the ornament and wealth of the saloon, will now coin itself into mere practical propositions and circulate on street and highway universally with results. A fourth estate of able editors springs up, increases and multiplies, irrepressible, incalculable. New printers, new journals, and ever new, so prurient is the world, let our three hundred curb and consolidate as they can. Lustelot, under the wing of Proudhon, dull blustering printer, edits weekly his Revolution de Paris in an acrid, emphatic manner. Acrid, corrosive, as the spirit of Slows and Copara is Marat, friend of the people, struck already with the fact that the National Assembly, so full of aristocrats, can do nothing except dissolve itself and make way for a better. That the town hall representatives are little other than babblers and imbeciles, if not even knaves. Poor is this man, squalid, and dwells in garrets. A man unlovely to the sense, outward and inward a man forbid, and is becoming fanatical, possessed with fixed idea. Cruel lucis of nature, did nature, O oh poor Marat, as in cruel sport, knead thee out of her leavings and miscellaneous waste clay, and fling thee forth step-dame-like, a distraction into this distracted eighteenth century? Work is appointed thee there, which thou shalt do. The three hundred have summoned and will again summon Marat, but always he croaks forth answer sufficient, always he will defy them or elude them and endure no gag. Cara, ex-secretary of the decapitated Hospodar and then of a necklace cardinal, likewise pamphleteer, adventurer in many scenes and lands, draws nigh to Messier of the Tableau de Paris and with foam on his lips proposes an anal patriotique. The monitor goes its prosperous way. Barrea weeps on paper as yet loyal. Riverol, Royou are not idle. Deep calls to deep. Your domine salvum fac regum shall awaken pange lingua 
With an Ami du Peuple, there is a King's Friend newspaper, Ami du Roi. Camille Desmoulins has appointed himself Procureur General de la Lanterne, Attorney General of the Lampion, and pleads, not with atrocity, under an atrocious title, editing weekly his brilliant Revolutions of Paris and Brabant. Brilliant, we say, for if in that thick murk of journalism with its dull blustering, with its fixed or loose fury, any ray of genius greet thee, be sure it is Camille's. The thing that Camille teaches us, he with his light finger adorns. Brightness plays, gentle, unexpected, amid horrible confusions. Often is the word of Camille worth reading when no other's is. Questionable Camille, how thou glitterest with a fallen, rebellious, yet still semi-celestial light, as is the starlight on the brow of Lucifer. Son of the morning, into what times and what lands art thou fallen? But in all things is good, though not good for consolidating revolutions. Thousand wagon-loads of this pamphleteering and newspaper matter lie rotting slowly in the public libraries of our Europe, snatched from the great gulf like oysters by bibliomaniac pearl-divers, there must they first rot, then what was pearl, in Camille or others, may be seen as such and continue as such. Nor has public speaking declined, though Lafayette and his patrols look sour on it. Loud always is the Palais Royal, loudest the Café de Foix, such a miscellany of citizens and citizenesses circulating there. Now and then, according to Camille, some citizens employ the liberty of the press for a private purpose, so that this or the other patriot finds himself short of his watch or pocket handkerchief. But for the rest, in Camille's opinion, nothing can be a livelier image of the Roman Forum. A patriot proposes his motion. If it finds any supporters, they make him mount on a chair and speak. If he is applauded, he prospers and redacts. If he is hissed, he goes his ways. Thus they circulating and perorating. Tall, shaggy, Marquis saint de Rouge, a man that has had his losses and has deserved them, is seen eminent and also heard. Bellowing is the character of his voice, like that of a bull of Bashan, voice which drowns all voices, which causes frequently the hearts of men to leap. Cracked or half-cracked is this tall Marquis's head, uncracked are his lungs, the cracked and the uncracked shall alike avail him. Consider, Father, that each of the forty-eight districts has his own committee, speaking and motioning continually, aiding in the search for grain, in the search for a constitution, checking and spurring the poor three hundred of the town hall. That Danton, with a voice reverberating from the domes, is president of the Cordelia's district, which has already become a Goshen of patriotism. That apart from the seventeen thousand utterly necessitous digging on Montmartre, most of whom, indeed, have got passes and been dismissed into space with four shillings, there is a strike or union of domestics out of place who assemble for public speaking. Next, a strike of tailors, for even they will strike and speak. Further, a strike of journeymen cordwainers, a strike of apothecaries, so dear is bread. All these, having struck, must speak generally under the open canopy, and pass resolutions, Lafayette and his patrols watching them suspiciously from the distance. Unhappy mortals, such tugging and lugging and throttling of one another to divide in some not intolerable way the joint felicity of man in this earth when the whole lot to be divided is such a feast of shells. Diligent are the three hundred. None equals Scipio Americanus in dealing with mobs. But surely all these things bode ill for the consolidating of a revolution. End of Book 6, Chapter 5《The French Revolution, A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 7, The Insurrection of Women Chapter 1, Patrolitism This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 7, Chapter 1. Patrolotism. No, friends, this revolution is not of the consolidating kind. 
Do not fires, fevers, sown seeds, chemical mixtures, men, events, all embodiments of force that work in this miraculous complex of forces named universe, go on growing through their natural phases and developments, each according to its kind, reach their height, reach their visible decline, finally sink under, vanishing, and what we call die? They all grow, there is nothing but what grows and shoots forth into its special expansion, once give it leave to spring. Observe, too, that each grows with a rapidity proportioned in general to the madness and unhealthiness there is in it. Slow, regular growth, though this also ends in death, is what we name health and sanity. A sanscolotism which has prostrated Bastilles, which has got pike and musket and now goes burning chateaus, passing resolutions and haranguing under roof and sky, may be said to have sprung and, by law of nature, must grow. To judge by the madness and diseasedness, both of itself and of the soil and element it is in, one might expect the rapidity and monstrosity would be extreme. Many things too, especially all diseased things, grow by shoots and fits. The first grand fit and shooting forth of sans colotism with that of Paris conquering its king. For Bailly's figure of rhetoric was all too sad a reality. The king is conquered, going at large on his parole, on condition, say, of absolutely good behaviour, which in these circumstances will unhappily mean no behaviour whatever. A quite untenable position, that of majesty put on its good behaviour. Alas, is it not natural that whatever lives try to keep itself living? Whereupon his majesty's behaviour will soon become exceptionable, and so the second grand fit of sans colotism, that of putting him in durance, cannot be destined. Necker, in the National Assembly, is making moan, as usual, about his deficit. Barriers and custom houses burnt, the tax gatherers hunted, not hunting, his majesty's exchequer all but empty. The remedy is a loan of thirty millions, then, on still more enticing terms, a loan of eighty millions, neither of which loans, unhappily, will the stock jobbers venture to lend. The stock jobber has no country except his own black pool of agio. And yet, in those days, for men that have a country, what a glow of patriotism burns in many a heart, penetrating inwards to the very purse. So early as the 7th of August, a dom patriotique, a patriotic gift of jewels to a considerable extent, has been solemnly made by certain Parisian women, and solemnly accepted with honourable mention, whom forthwith all the world takes to imitating and emulating, Patriotic gifts, always with some heroic eloquence which the President must answer and the Assembly listen to, flow in from far and near, in such numbers that the honourable mention can only be performed in lists published at stated epochs. Each gives what he can. The very cordwainers have behaved munificently. One landed proprietor gives a forest. Fashionable society gives its shoe buckles, takes cheerfully to shoe ties. Unfortunate females give what they have amassed in loving. The smell of all cash, as Vespasian thought, is good. Beautiful, and yet inadequate. The clergy must be invited to melt their superfluous church plate in the royal mint. Nay, finally, a patriotic contribution of the forcible sort must be determined on, though unwillingly. Let the fourth part of your declared yearly revenue, for this once only, be paid down. So shall a National Assembly make the Constitution, undistracted at least by insolvency. Their own wages, as settled on the 17th of August, are but 18 francs a day, each man. But the public service must have sinews, must have money. To appease the deficit, not to combler or choke the deficit, if you or mortal could. For with all, as Mirabeau was heard saying, it is the deficit that saves us. Towards the end of August, our National Assembly, in its constitutional labours, has got so far as the question of veto. Shall Majesty have a veto on the national enactments, or not have a veto? What speeches were spoken, within doors and without, clear and also passionate logic, imprecations, combinations, gone happily for the most part to limbo. Through the cracked brain and uncracked lungs of saint Eurouge, the Palais-Royal rebellows with veto. Journalism is busy, 
France rings with veto. I shall never forget, says Dumont, my going to Paris one of these days with Mirabeau and the crowd of people we found waiting for his carriage about Leger, the bookseller's shop. They flung themselves before him, conjuring him with tears in their eyes not to suffer the veto absolu. They were in a frenzy. Monsieur le Comte, you are the people's father. You must save us. You must defend us against those villains who are bringing back despotism. If the king gets this veto, what is the use of National Assembly? We are slaves. All is done. Friends, if the sky fall, there will be catching of larks. Mirabeau, adds Dumont, was eminent on such occasions. He answered vaguely, with a patrician imperturbability, and bound himself to nothing. Deputations go to the Hôtel de Ville, anonymous letters to aristocrats in the National Assembly, threatening that 15,000, or sometimes that 60,000, will march to illuminate you. The Paris districts are astir. Petition signing. saint Hiroux sets forth from the Palais Royal with an escort of 1,500 individuals to petition in person. Resolute, or seemingly so, is the tall shaggy Marquis in the Café de Foire, but resolute also is Commandant General Lafayette. The streets are all beset by patrols. saint Hiroux is stopped at the Barrière des Bonhommes. He may bellow like the bulls of Bashan, but absolutely must return. The brethren of the Palais Royal circulate all night and make motions under the open canopy, all coffee houses being shut. Nevertheless, Lafayette and the town hall do prevail. saint Rouge is thrown into prison. Veto absolu adjusts itself into suspensive veto, prohibition, not forever, but for a term of time. And this doom's clamour will grow silent, as the others have done. So far has consolidation prospered, though with difficulty, repressing the nether sanscalotic world, and the constitution shall be made. With difficulty, amid jubilee and scarcity, patriotic gifts, bakers' queues, Abbe Fauché's harangues with their armin of platoon musketry. Scipio Americanus has deserved thanks from the National Assembly and France. They offer him stipends and emoluments to a handsome extent, or which stipends and emoluments he, covetous of far other blessedness than mere money, does in his chivalrous way, without scruple, refuse. To the Parisian common man, meanwhile, one thing remains inconceivable that now, when the Bastille is down and French liberty restored, grain should continue so dear. Our rights of man are voted, feudalism and all tyranny abolished. Yet behold, we stand in queue. Is it aristocrat forestallers? A court still bent on intrigues? Something is rotten somewhere. And yet, alas, what to do? Lafayette, with his patrols, prohibits everything, even complaint. saint Rouge and other heroes of the veto lie in durance. People's friend Marat was seized. Printers of patriotic journals are fettered and forbidden. The very hawkers cannot cry till they get license and leaden badges. Blue National Guards ruthlessly dissipate all groups, scour with levelled bayonets the Palais Royal itself, Pass on your affairs along the Rue Taran, the patrol presenting his bayonet cries. To the left, turn into the Rue Saint-Benoît, he cries. To the right. A judicious patriot like Camille Desmoulins in this instant is driven for quietness sake to take the gutter. Oh, much suffering people, our glorious revolution is evaporating in trickle ceremonies and complimentary harangues of which latter, as Lustelot accurately calculates, upwards of 2,000 have been delivered within the last month at the town hall alone. And our mouths, unfilled with bread, are to be shut under penalties. The caricaturist promulgates his emblematic tablature. La patrouletism chassant le patriotisme. Patriotism driven out by patrolatism. Ruthless patrols, long, superfine harangues, and scanty, ill-baked loaves, more like baked bath bricks, which produce an effect on the intestines. Where will this end? In consolidation? End of Book 7, Chapter 1《The French Revolution, A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 7, The Insurrection of Women, Chapter 2, 
O Richard, O my King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 7, Chapter 2. O Richard, O my King. For alas, neither is the town hall itself without misgivings. The nether sans calotic world has been suppressed hitherto, but then the upper court world, symptoms there are that the oid de birth is rallying. More than once in the town hall Sanhedrin, often enough from those outspoken baker's cues, has the wish uttered itself, Oh, that our restorer of French liberty were here, that he could see with his own eyes, not with the false eyes of queens and cabals, and his really good heart be enlightened. For falsehood still environs him, intriguing dukes de guiche with bodyguards, scouts of bouillet, a new flight of intriguers, now that the old is flown. What else means this advent of the regiment de Flandre entering Versailles as we hear on the 23rd of September with two pieces of cannon? Did not the Versailles National Guard do duty at the chateau? Had they not Swiss? Hundred Swiss, Guard du corps, bodyguards so called. Nay, it would seem the number of bodyguards on duty has, by a manoeuvre, been doubled. The new relieving battalion of them arrived at its time, but the old relieved one does not depart. Actually, there runs a whisper through the best-informed upper circles, or a nod still more portentous than whispering, of His Majesty's flying to Metz, of a bond to stand by him therein, which has been signed by noblesse and clergy to the incredible amount of thirty or even of sixty thousand. Lafayette coldly whispers it and coldly asseverates it to Count d'Estaing at the dinner table, and d'Estaing, one of the bravest men, quakes to the core lest some lackey overhear it and tumbles thoughtful without sleep all night. Her regiment Flandre, as we said, is clearly arrived. His Majesty, they say, hesitates about sanctioning the 4th of August, makes observations of chilling tenor on the very rights of man. Likewise may not all persons, the bakers' queues themselves, discern on the streets of Paris the most astonishing number of officers on furlough, crosses of St. Louis and such like. Some reckon from a thousand to twelve hundred. Officers of all uniforms, nay, one uniform never before seen by eye, green faced with red. The tricolour cockade is not always visible, but what in the name of heaven may these black cockades which somewhere foreshadow? Hunger wets everything, especially suspicion and indignation. Realities themselves in this Paris have grown unreal, preternatural. Phantasms once more stalk through the brain of hungry France. O oh, ye laggards and dastards, cry shrill voices from the queues. If ye had the hearts of men, ye would take your pikes and second-hand firelocks and look into it, not leave your wives and daughters to be starved, murdered and worse. Peace, women. The heart of man is busy and heavy. Patriotism, driven out by patrolatism, knows not what to resolve on. The truth is, the Oi de Boeuf has rallied, to a certain, unknown extent. A changed Oi de Boeuf, with Versailles National Guards in their tricolour cockades doing duty there, a court all flaring with tricolour. Yet, even to a tricolour court, men will rally... Ye loyal hearts, burnt-out seigneurs, rally round your queen with wishes which will produce hopes, which will produce attempts. For indeed, self-preservation being such a law of nature, what can a rallied court do but attempt an endeavour, or call it plot, with such wisdom and unwisdom as it has? They will fly escorted to Metz, where brave Bouillet commands. They will raise the royal standard. The bond signatures shall become armed men. Were not the king so languid, their bond, if at all signed, must be signed without his privity. Unhappy king, he has but one resolution, not to have a civil war. For the rest he still hunts. Having ceased lock-making, he still dozes and digests. Is clay in the hands of the potter. Ill will it fare with him in a world where all is helping itself, where, as has been written, whosoever is not hammer must be stithy, and the very hiss upon the wall grows there in that chink because the whole universe could not prevent its growing. But as for the coming up of this regiment to Flandre, may it not be urged that there were Saint-Durge petitions and continual meal mobs? 
undebauched soldiers be their plot, or any dim elements of a plot, are always good. Did not the Versailles municipality, an old monarchic one not yet refounded into a democratic, instantly second the proposal? Nay, the very Versailles National Guard, wearied with continual duty at the chateau, did not object. Only Draper Le Quintre, who is now Major Le Quintre, shook his head. Yes, friends, surely it was natural this regiment de Flandre should be sent for since it could be got. It was natural that, at sight of military bandoliers, the heart of the rallied Oeil de Boeuf should revive, and maids of honour and gentlemen of honour speak comfortable words to epauletted defenders and to one another. Natural also, and mere common civility, that the bodyguards, a regiment of gentlemen, should invite their Flandre brethren to a dinner of welcome. Such invitation, in the last days of September, is given and accepted. Dinners are defined as the ultimate act of communion. Men that can have communion in nothing else can sympathetically eat together, can still rise into some glow of brotherhood over food and wine. The dinner is fixed on for Thursday the 1st of October and ought to have a fine effect. Further, as such dinner may be rather extensive and even the non-commissioned and the common man be introduced to see and to hear, could not His Majesty's opera apartment, which has lain quite silent ever since Kaiser Joseph was here, be obtained for the purpose? The hall of the opera is granted. The Salon d'Hercule shall be drawing-room. Not only the officers of Flandre, but of the Swiss, of the hundred Swiss, nay, of the Versailles National Guard, such of them as have any loyalty, shall feast. It will be a repast like few. And now, suppose this repast, the solid part of it, transacted and the first bottle over. Suppose the customary loyal toasts drunk, the king's health, the queen's with deafening vivats, that of the nation omitted or even rejected. Suppose champagne flowing, with pot valorous speeches, with instrumental music, empty feathered heads growing ever the noisier in their own emptiness in each other's noise. Her Majesty, who looks unusually sad tonight, His Majesty sitting dulled with the day's hunting, is told that the sight of it would cheer her. Behold, she enters there, issuing from her state rooms, like the moon from the clouds, this fairest unhappy queen of hearts royal husband by her side, young Dauphin in her arms. She descends from the boxes amid splendours and acclaim, walks queen-like round the tables, gracefully escorted, gracefully nodding, her looks full of sorrow yet of gratitude and daring with the hope of France on her mother bosom. And now the band striking up, O oh Richard, O oh mon roi, l'univers t'abandonne, O oh Richard, O oh my king, and world is all forsaking thee. Could man do other than rise to height of pity, of loyal valour? Could feather-headed young ensigns do other than, by white bourbon cockades handed them from fair fingers, by waving of swords drawn to pledge the Queen's health, by trampling of national cockades, by scaling the boxes whence intrusive murmurs may come, by vociferation, tripudiation, sound, fury and distraction, within doors and without, testify what tempest-tossed state of vacuity they are in? till champagne and tripudiation do their work, and all lie silent, horizontal, passively slumbering, with mead of battle dreams. A natural repast, in ordinary times a harmless one, now fatal, as that of Thyestes, as that of Job's sons, when a strong wind smote the four corners of their banquet house. Poor, ill-advised Marie Antoinette, with a woman's vehemence, not with a sovereign's foresight, it was so natural, yet so unwise. Next day, in public speech of ceremony, Her Majesty declares herself delighted with the Thursday. The heart of the Oye de Boeuf glows into hope, into daring, which is premature. Rallied maids of honour, waited on by abbés, so white cockades, distribute them with words, with glances to epauletted youths, who in return may kiss, not without fervour, the fair sewing fingers. Captains of horse and foot go swashing with enormous white cockades. Nay, one Versailles national captain had mounted the like, so witching with the words and glances, and laid aside his tricolor. Well may Mere Le Quintre shake his head with a look of severity and speak audible resentful words. 
but now a swashbuckler with enormous white cockade overhearing the major invites him insolently once and then again elsewhere to recant and failing that to duel which latter feat Major Laquantra declares that he will not perform, not at least by any known laws of fence, that he nevertheless will, according to mere law of nature, by dirk and blade, exterminate any vile gladiator who may insult him or the nation. Whereupon, for the Major is actually drawing his implement, they are parted, and no weasand slit. End of Book 7, Chapter 2 The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1. Book 7, The Insurrection of Women. Chapter 3, Black Cockades. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 7, Chapter 3, Black Cockades. But fancy what effect this Thyestes repast and trampling on the national cockade must have had in the Salle des Menus in the famishing bakers' queues at Paris. Nay, such Thyestes repasts, it would seem, continue. Flandre has given its counter-dinner to the Swiss and hundred Swiss. Then on Saturday there has been another. Yes, here with us is famine, but yonder at Versailles is food, enough and to spare. Patriotism stands in queue, shivering hunger-struck, insulted by patrolatism, while bloody-minded aristocrats, heated with excess of living high, trample on the national cockade. Can the atrocity be true? Nay, look, green uniforms faced with red, black cockades, the colour of night. Are we to have military onfall and death also by starvation? For behold, the Corbeil corn-boat, which used to come twice a day with its plaster of Paris meal, now comes only once. And the town hall is deaf, and the men are laggard and dastard. At the Café de Foire this Saturday evening a new thing is seen, not the last of its kind, a woman engaged in public speaking. Her poor man, she says, was put to silence by his district. Their presidents and officials would not let him speak. Wherefore she here with her shrill tongue will speak, denouncing, while her breath endures, the corbeil boat, the plaster of Paris bread, sacrilegious opera dinners, green uniforms, pirate aristocrats, and those black cockades of theirs. Truly it is time for the black cockades at least to vanish. Them, patrolatism itself will not protect. Nay, sharp-tempered Monsieur Tassin, at the Tuileries parade on Sunday morning, forgets all national military rule, starts from the ranks, wrenches down one blockade, which is swashing ominous there, and tramples it fiercely into the soil of France. Patrolatism itself is not without suppressed fury. Also, the districts begin to stir. The voice of President Danton reverberates in the Cordeliers, People's friend Marat has flown to Versailles and back again, swart bird, not of the halcyon kind. And so Patriot meets promenading Patriot this Sunday and sees his own grim care reflected on the face of another. Groups, in spite of patrolatism, which is not so alert as usual, fluctuate deliberative. Groups on the bridges, on the quays, at the patriotic cafes. And ever as any black cockade may emerge, rises the many-voiced growl and bark, Abba! Down! All black cockades are ruthlessly plucked off. One individual picks his up again, kisses it, attempts to refix it. But a hundred canes start into the air, and he desists. Still worse went it with another individual, doomed by extempore plebiscitum to the lantern saved with difficulty by some active corps de garde. Lafayette sees signs of an effervescence, which he doubles his patrols, doubles his diligence to prevent. So passes Sunday, the 4th of October, 1789. Sullen is the male heart, repressed by patrolatism. Vehement is the female, irrepressible. The public-speaking woman at the Palais Royal was not the only speaking one. Men know not what the pantry is, when it grows empty, only house-mothers know. 
O oh, women, wives of men that will only calculate and not act. Patrolitism is strong, but death by starvation and military onfall is stronger. Patrolitism represses male patriotism, but female patriotism? Will guards named national thrust their bayonets into the bosoms of women? Such thought, or rather such dim, unshaped, raw material of a thought, ferments universally under the female nightcap, and by earliest daybreak, on slight hint, will explode. End of Book 7, Chapter 3《The French Revolution — A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 7 — The Insurrection of Women Chapter 4 — The Menads This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Book 7 — Chapter 4 — The Menads If Voltaire once, in splenetic humour, asked his countrymen, But you, Gualsh, what have you invented? They can now answer, The Art of Insurrection it was an art indeed needed in these last singular times, an art for which the French nature, so full of vehemence, so free from depth, was perhaps of all others the fittest. Accordingly, to what a height, one may well say, of perfection has this branch of human industry been carried by France within the last half-century? Insurrection, which Lafayette thought might be the most sacred of duties, ranks now for the French people among the duties which they can perform. Other mobs are dull masses which roll onwards with a dull, fierce tenacity, a dull, fierce heat, but emit no light flashes of genius as they go. The French mob, again, is among the liveliest phenomena of our world. So rapid, audacious, so clear-sighted, inventive, prompt to seize the moment, instinct with life to its finger-ends, that talent, there were no other, of spontaneously standing in queue, distinguishes, as we said, the French people from all peoples, ancient and modern. Let the reader confess, too, that, taking one thing with another, perhaps few terrestrial appearances are better worth considering than mobs. Your mob is a genuine outburst of nature, issuing from, or communicating with, the deepest deep of nature. When so much goes grinning and grimacing as a lifeless formality, and under the stiff buckram no heart can be felt beating, here, once more, if nowhere else, is a sincerity and reality. Shudder at it, or even shrink over it if thou must, nevertheless consider it. Such a complex of human forces and individualities hurled forth in their transcendental mood to act and react on circumstances and on one another, to work out what it is in them to work. The thing they will do is known to no man, least of all to themselves. It is the inflammablest, immeasurable firework, generating, consuming itself. With what phases, to what extent, with what results it will burn off, philosophy and perspicacity conjecture in vain. Man, as has been written, is forever interesting to man. Nay, properly, there is nothing else interesting. In which light also may we not discern why most battles have become so wearisome. Battles in these ages are transacted by mechanism, with the slightest possible development of human individuality or spontaneity. Men now even die and kill one another in an artificial manner. Battles ever since Homer's time, when they were fighting mobs, have mostly ceased to be worth looking at, worth reading of or remembering. How many wearisome bloody battles does history strive to represent, or even in a husky way to sing, and she would omit or carelessly slur over this one insurrection of women? A thought, or dim, raw material of a thought, was fermenting all night, universally in the female head, and might explode. In squalid garret, on Monday morning, maternity awakes to hear children weeping for bread. Maternity must forth to the streets, to the herb markets and bakers. Cues meets there with hunger-stricken maternity, sympathetic, exasperative. Oh, we unhappy women! But instead of bakers' cues, why not to aristocrats' palaces, the root of the matter? 
Allons, let us assemble to the Hotel de Ville, to Versailles, to the Lantern. In one of the guardhouses of the Quartier saint Dustache, a young woman seizes a drum. For how shall National Guards give fire on women, on a young woman? The young woman seizes the drum, sets forth, beating it, uttering cries relative to the dearth of grains. Descend, O mothers, descend, ye Judiths, to food and revenge. All women gather and go. Crowds storm all stairs, force out all women. The female insurrectionary force, according to Camilla, resembles the English naval one. There is a universal press of women. Robust dames of the Hall, slim mantua makers, assiduous, risen from the dawn, ancient virginity tripping to matins, the housemaid with early broom, all must go. Rouse ye, O women, the laggard men will not act. They say, we ourselves may act. And so, like snowbreak from the mountains, for every staircase is a melted brook, it storms, tumultuous, wild shrilling, towards the Hotel de Ville tumultuous with or without drum music, for the Faubourg Saint Antoine also has tucked up its gown, and with besom staves, fire irons, and even rusty pistols, void of ammunition, is flowing on. Sound of it flies with the velocity of sound to the utmost barriers. By seven o'clock, on this raw October morning, fifth of the month, the town hall will see wonders. Nay, as chance would have it, a male party are already there, clustering tumultuously round some national patrol and a baker who has been seized with short weights. They are there and have even lowered the rope of the lantern, so that the official persons have to smuggle forth the short-weighing baker by back doors and even send to all the districts for more force. Grand it was, says Camilla, to see so many Judiths, from eight to ten thousand of them in all, rushing out to search into the root of the matter. Not unfrightful it must have been, ludicro, terrific, and most unmanageable. At such hour the overwatched three hundred are not yet stirring. None but some clerks, a company of national guards, and Monsieur de Gouvion, the major general, Gouvion has fought in America for the cause of civil liberty, a man of no inconsiderable heart, but deficient in head. He is, for the moment, in his back apartment, assuaging Ashamayad, the Bastille sergeant, who has come, as too many do, with representations. The assuagement is still incomplete when our Judiths arrive. The National Guards form on the outer stairs with levelled bayonets, the ten thousand Judiths press up, resistless, with obtestations, with outspread hands, merely to speak to the mayor. The rear forces them, nay, from male hands in the rear, stones already fly. The National Guards must do one of two things, sweep the plaster grave with cannon, or else open to right and left. They open, the living deluge rushes in through all rooms and cabinets, upwards to the topmost belfry, ravenous, seeking arms, seeking mares, seeking justice, while again the better crest, dressed, speak kindly to the clerks, point out the misery of these poor women, also their ailments, some even of an interesting sort. Poor Monsieur de Gouvion is shiftless in this extremity, a man shiftless, perturbed, who will one day commit suicide. How happy for him that Ashamayad, the shifty, was there at the moment, though making representations. Fly back, thou shifty, my yard. Seek the Bastille company, and, oh, return fast with it, above all, with thy own shifty head. For, behold, the Judiths can find no mayor or municipal. Scarcely in the topmost belfry can they find poor Abbe Lefebvre, the powder distributor. Him, for want of a better, they suspend there, in the pale morning light, over the top of all Paris, which swims in one's failing eyes. A horrible end? Nay, the rope broke, as French ropes often did, or else an Amazon cut it. Abbe Lefebvre falls some twenty feet, rattling among the leads, and lives long years after, though always with a tremblement in the limbs. And now doors fly under hatchets. The Judiths have broken the armoury, have seized guns and cannons, three money bags, paper heaps, torches flare. In few minutes our brave Hôtel de Ville, which dates from the fourth Henry, will, with all that it holds, be in flames.
End of Book 7, Chapter 4《The French Revolution》A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 7, The Insurrection of Women Chapter 5, Usher Maillard This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Book 7, Chapter 5, Usher Maillard In flames, truly, were it not that Usher Maillard, swift of foot, shifty of head, has returned. Maillard, of his own motion, for Gouvion or the rest would not even sanction him, snatches a drum, descends the porch stairs, rent and beating sharp with loud rolls his robes march. To Versailles! Allons! À Versailles! As men beat on kettle or warming pan when angry she-bees, or, say, flying desperate wasps, are to be hived, and the desperate insects hear it and cluster round it, simply as round a guidance where there was none, so now these menads round shifty Maillard, riding usher of the Châtelet. The axe pauses uplifted. Abbe Lefebvre is left half-hanged from the belfry downwards, all vomits itself. What rubber-dub is that? Stanislav Maillard, Bastille hero, will lead us to Versailles? Joy to thee, Maillard, blessed art thou above riding ushers. Away, then, away! The seized cannon are yoked with seized cart horses. Brown locked Demoiselle Terogne, with pike and helmet, sits there as gunneress, with haughty eye and serene fair countenance, comparable, some think, to the maid of Orleans, or even recalling the idea of Pallas Athene. Maillard, for his drum still rolls on, is by heaven rending acclamation admitted general. Maillard hastens the languid march, Maillard, beating rhythmic with sharp rant-tan all along the quays, leads forward with difficulty his menadic host. Such a host marched not in silence, the bargeman pauses on the river. All wagoners and coach-drivers fly, men peer from windows, not women, lest they be pressed. Sight of sights, bacantes in these ultimate formalised ages, Bronze Henri looks on from his Pont Neuf, the monarchic Louvre, Medician Tuileries see a day not theretofore seen. And now Maillard has his menads in the Champs Elysees, Fields Tartarian rather, and the Hotel de Ville has suffered comparatively nothing. Broken doors, an Abbe Lefebvre who shall never more distribute powder, three sacks of money, most part of which, for sans culottism, though famishing, is not without honour, shall be returned. This is all the damage. Great Maillard! A small nucleus of order is round his drum, but his outskirts fluctuate like the mad ocean, for rascality male and female is flowing in on him from the four winds. Guidance there is none but in his single head and two drumsticks. Oh, my yard, when, since war first was, had General of Force such a task before him as they are this day? Walter the Penniless still touches the feeling heart, but then Walter had sanction, had space to turn in, and also his crusaders were of the male sex. Thou, this day, disowned of heaven and earth, art General of Menads. Their inarticulate frenzy thou must, on the spur of the instant, render into articulate words, into actions that are not frantic. Fail in it, this way or that. Pragmatical officiality, with its penalties and law books, waits before thee. Menard storm behind. If such hewed off the melodious head of Orpheus and hurled it into the penious waters, what may they not make of thee? The rhythmic merely, with no music but a sheepskin drum. Maillard did not fail. Remarkable Maillard, if fame were not an accident and history a distillation of rumour, how remarkable wert thou! On the Elysian fields there is pause and fluctuation, but for Maillard, no return. He persuades his menads, clamorous for arms and the arsenal, that no arms are in the arsenal, that an unarmed attitude and petition to a national assembly will be the best. He hastily nominates or sanctions generalesses, captains of tens and fifties, and so, in loosest flowing order to the rhythm of some eight drums, having laid aside his own, with the Bastille volunteers bringing up his rear, once more takes the road. 
Shayo, which will promptly yield baked loaves, is not plundered, nor are the Sevres potteries broken. The old arches of Sevres Bridge echo under magnetic feet. Seine River gushes on with his perpetual murmur, and Paris flings after us the boom of toxin and alarm drum, inaudible for the present amid shrill-sounding hosts and the splash of rainy weather. To Meudon, to Saint-Cloud, on both hands, the report of them is gone abroad, and hearths this evening will have a topic. The press of women still continues, for it is the cause of all Eve's daughters, mothers that are or that hope to be. No carriage lady were it with never such hysterics, but must dismount in the mud roads in her silk shoes and walk. In this manner, amid wild October weather, they, a wild, unwinged stork flight, through the astonished country, wend their way. Travellers of all sorts they stop, especially travellers or couriers from Paris. Deputy Le Chapalier, in his elegant vesture, from his elegant vehicle, looks forth amazed through his spectacles, apprehensive for life, states eagerly that he is a patriot deputy, Le Chapalier, and even old President Le Chapalier, who presided on the night of Pentecost and is original member of the Breton Club. Thereupon rises huge shout of Vive Le Palier, and several armed persons spring up behind and before to escort him. Nevertheless, news, dispatches from Lafayette or vague noise of rumour have pierced through by side roads. In the National Assembly, while all is busy discussing the order of the day, regretting that there should be anti-national repasts in opera halls, that His Majesty should still hesitate about accepting the rights of man and hang conditions and peradventures on them, Mirabeau steps up to the President, experienced Mounier as it chanced to be, and articulates in bass undertone, Monia Paris marche sous noir. Paris is marching on us. Maybe. Je n'en sais rien. Believe it or disbelieve it, that is not my concern, but Paris, I say, is marching on us. Fall suddenly unwell. Go over to the chateau. Tell them this. There is not a moment to lose. Paris, marching on us, responds Mounier with an atrabiliar accent. Well, so much the better. We shall the sooner be a republic. Mirabeau quits him as one quits an experienced president getting blindfold into deep waters, and the order of the day continues as before. Yes, Paris is marching on us, and more than the women of Paris. Scarcely was my art gone when Monsieur de Gouvion's message to all the districts and such toxin and drumming of the General began to take effect. Armed National Guards from every district, especially the Grenadiers of the Centre, who are our old Garde Francais, arrive in quick sequence on the Place de Grève. An immense people is there. Saint Antoine, with pike and rusty fire, like us all crowding thither, be it welcome or unwelcome. The Centre Grenadiers are received with cheering. It is not cheers that we want, answer they gloomily. The nation has been insulted. To arms and come with us for orders. Ha! Sits the wind so. Patriotism and patrolatism are now one. The three hundred have assembled. All the committees are in activity. Lafayette is dictating dispatches for Versailles when a deputation of the Centre Grenadiers introduces itself to him. The deputation makes military obeisance and speaks not without a kind of thought in it. Mon général, we are deputed for the six companies of Grenadiers. We do not think you a traitor. But we think the government betrays you. It is time that this end. We cannot turn our bayonets against women crying to us for bread. The people are miserable. The source of the mischief is at Versailles. We must go seek the king and bring him to Paris. We must exterminate, exterminate, the regiment of Flandre and the garde du corps who have dared to trample on the national cockade. If the king be too weak to wear his crown, let him lay it down. You will crown his son, you will name a council of regency, and all will go better. Reproachful astonishment paints itself on the face of Lafayette, speaks itself from his eloquent, chivalrous lips, in vain. My general, we would shed the last drop of our blood for you, but the root of the mischief is at Versailles. We must go and bring the king to Paris. All the people wish it. To le peuple, le veu. My general descends to the outer staircase and harangues once more in vain. To Versailles, to Versailles. 
Mayor Bailly is sent for, through floods of sans-culottism, attempts academic oratory from his gilt state coach, realises nothing but infinite hoarse cries of Bread to Versailles! and gladly shrinks within doors. Lafayette mounts the white charger and again harangues and re-harangues with eloquence, with firmness, indignant demonstration, with all things but persuasion. To Versailles! To Versailles! So lasts it hour after hour for the space of half a day. The great Scipio Americanus can do nothing, not so much as escape. Moblo, mon général, cry the grenadiers, serrying their ranks as the white charger makes a motion that way. You will not leave us. You will abide with us. A perilous juncture. Mayor Bailly and the municipals sit quaking within doors. My general is prisoner without. The Place de Grave, with its 30,000 regulars, its whole irregular Saint Antoine and Saint Marceau, is one minatory mass of clear or rusty steel, all hearts set with a moody fixedness on one object. Moody fixed are all hearts, tranquil is no heart, if it be not that of the white charger who pours there with arched neck, composedly champing his bit, as if no world with its dynasties and eras were now rushing down. The drizzling day tends westward. The cry is still, To Versailles! Nay, now, born from afar, come quite sinister cries, hoarse reverberating in long-drawn hollow murmurs, with syllables too like those of lantern. Or else irregular sans colotism may be marching off, of itself, with pikes, nay, with cannon. The inflexible Scipio does at length, by aide-de-camp, ask of the municipals whether or not he may go. A letter is handed out to him over armed heads. Sixty thousand faces flash fixedly on his. There is stillness and no bosom breathes till he have read. By heaven he grows suddenly pale. Do the municipals permit? Permit and even order, since he can no other. Clangor of approval rends the welkin. To your ranks, then, let us march. It is, as we compute, towards three in the afternoon. Indignant National Guards may dine for once from their haversack. Dined or undined, they march with one heart. Paris flings up her windows, claps hands as the Avengers with their shrilling drums and shams tramp by. She will then sit pensive, apprehensive, and pass rather a sleepless night. On the white charger, Lafayette, in the slowest possible manner, going and coming and eloquently haranguing among the ranks, rolls onward with his thirty thousand. Saint Antoine, with pike and cannons, has preceded him, a mixed multitude of all and of no arms, hovers on his flanks and skirts, the country once more pauses agape. Paris marche sur nous. End of Book 7, Chapter 5《The French Revolution》A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume One, Book Seven: The Insurrection of Women, Chapter Six to Versailles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan, Book Seven, Chapter Six to Versailles. For indeed, about this same moment, Maillard has halted his draggled menads on the last hilltop, and now Versailles and the chateau of Versailles, and far and wide the inheritance of royalty, opens to the wondering eye. From far on the right of Amalie and Saint-Germain-en-Laye, round towards Rambouillet on the left, beautiful all, softly embosomed, as if in sadness in the dim, moist weather. And near before us is Versailles, new and old, with that broad front and avenue de Versailles between, stately front and broad, three hundred feet as men reckon, with four rows of elms, and then the Chateau de Versailles, ending in royal parks and pleasances, gleaming lakelets, arbours, labyrinths, the menagerie, and great and little Trianon. High towered dwellings, leafy pleasant places, where the gods of this lower world abide. Whence, nevertheless, black care cannot be excluded. Whither monadic hunger is even now advancing, armed with pike thoracy. 
Yes, yonder, mesdames, where our straight Frondent Avenue, joined, as you note, by two Frondent Brother Avenues from this hand and from that, spreads out into Place Royale and Palace Forecourt, yonder is the Salle des Menus. Yonder, an august assembly sits regenerating France. Forecourt, Grand Court, Court of Marble, Court narrowing into Court, you may discern next or fancy, on the extreme verge of which that glass dome, visibly glittering like a star of hope, is the Oeil de Boeuf. Yonder, or nowhere in the world, is bread baked for us. But, uh, oh, my dames, were not one thing good, that our cannons, with Demoiselle Terania and all show of war, be put to the rear? Submission beseems petitioners of a national assembly. We are strangers in Versailles, whence, too audibly, there comes even now sound as of Toxin and the General. Also, to put on, if possible, a cheerful countenance, hiding our sorrows, and even to sing? Sorrow, pitied of the heavens, is hateful, suspicious to the earth. So counsels Shifty Maillard, haranguing his menads on the heights near Versailles. Cunning Maillard's dispositions are obeyed. The draggled insurrectionists advance up the avenue, in three columns, among the four Elmrows, singing Henri Quatre with what melody they can, and shouting Vive le Roi! Versailles, though the elm rows are dripping wet, crowds from both sides with Vivons en Parisienne, our Paris ones forever. Prickers, scouts, have been out towards Paris as the rumour deepened, whereby His Majesty, gone to shoot in the woods of Meudon, has been happily discovered and got home, and the General and Toxin set a sounding. The bodyguards are already drawn up in front of the palace grates and look down the avenue de Versailles, sulky in wet buckskins. Flandre, too, is there, repentant of the opera repast. Also dragoons dismounted are there. Finally, Major Lacointre and what he can gather of the Versailles National Guard, though it is to be observed our colonel, that same sleepless Count d'Estaing, giving neither order nor ammunition, has vanished most improperly, one supposes, into the Oeil de Boeuf. Red-coated Swiss stand within the grates, under arms. There likewise, in their inner room, all the ministers, Saint-Priest, Lamentation Pompignon and the rest, are assembled with Monsieur Necker. They sit with him there, blank, expecting what the hour will bring. Monsieur Mounier, though he answered Mirabeau with a ton mieux and affected to slight the matter, had his own forebodings. Surely for these four weary hours he has reclined not on roses. The order of the day is getting forward. A deputation to His Majesty seems proper that it might please him to grant acceptance pure and simple to those Constitution articles of ours. The mixed qualified acceptance with its per adventures is satisfactory to neither gods nor men. So much is clear, and yet there is more which no man speaks, which all men now vaguely understand. Disquietude, absence of mind is on every face. Members whisper, uneasily come and go. The order of the day is evidently not the day's want. Till at length, from the outer gates, is heard a rustling and justling, shrill uproar and squabbling, muffled by walls, which testifies that the hour is come. Rushing and crushing one hears now, then enter ushered my yard with a deputation of fifteen muddy, dripping women, having, by incredible industry and aid of all the maces, persuaded the rest to wait out of doors. National Assembly shall now, therefore, look its august task directly in the face. Regenerative constitutionalism has an unregenerate sans colotism bodily in front of it, crying, Bread! Bread! Shifty Maillard, translating frenzy into articulation, repressive with the one hand, expostulative with the other, does his best, and really, though not bred to public speaking, manages rather well. In the present dreadful rarity of grains, a deputation of female citizens has, as the august assembly can discern, come out from Paris to petition. 
plots of aristocrats are too evident in the matter. For example, one miller has been bribed by a banknote of 200 livres not to grind. Name unknown to the usher, but fact provable, at least indubitable. Further, it seems, the national cockade has been trampled on. Also, there are black cockades, or were. All which things will not an august national assembly, the hope of France, take into its wise immediate consideration? And menadic hunger, irrepressible, crying black cockades, crying bread, bread, adds after such fashion, will it not? Yes, messieurs, if a deputation to his majesty for the acceptance pure and simple seems proper, how much more now for the afflicting situation of Paris, for the calming of this effervescence? President Mounier, with a speedy deputation, among whom we notice the respectable figure of Dr. Guillotin, gets himself forthwith on march. Vice-president shall continue the order of the day. Usher Mayard shall stay by him to repress the women. It is four o'clock of the miserablest afternoon when Mounier steps out. Oh, experienced Mounier, what an afternoon! The last of thy political existence! Better had it been to fall suddenly unwell while it was yet time. For behold, the esplanade, over all its spacious expanse, is covered with groups of squalid, dripping women, of lank-haired male rascality armed with axes, rusty pikes, old muskets, iron-shod clubs, baton ferre, which end in knives or sword blades, a kind of extempore billhook, looking nothing but hungry revolt. The rain pours, Garde du corps go caracoling through the groups, amid hisses, irritating and agitating what is but dispersed here to reunite there. Innumerable squalid women beleaguer the president and deputation, insist on going with him. Has not his majesty himself, looking from the window, sent out to ask what we wanted? Bread and speech with the king. Du pain et parle et roi. That was the answer. Twelve women are clamorously added to the deputation and march with it across the esplanade through dissipated groups, caracoling bodyguards and the pouring rain. Monsieur Mounier, unexpectedly augmented by twelve women, copiously escorted by hunger and rascality, is himself mistaken for a group. Himself and his women are dispersed by caracolers, rally again with difficulty among the mud. Finally the grates are opened. The deputation gets access, with the twelve women too in it, of which latter five shall even see the face of his majesty. Let wet menadism in the best spirits it can expect their return. End of Book 7, Chapter 6《The French Revolution, A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 7. The Insurrection of Women. Chapter 7. At Versailles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 7. Chapter 7. At Versailles. But already Pallas Athene, in the shape of Demoiselle Terogne, is busy with Flandre and the dismounted dragoons. She and such women as are fittest go through the ranks, speak with an earnest jocosity, clasp rough troopers to their patriot bosom, crush down spontoons and musketoons with soft arms. Can a man that were worthy of the name of man attack famishing patriot women? One reads that Terania had bags of money which he distributed over Flandre. Furnished by whom? Alas, with money bags one seldom sits on insurrectionary cannon. Calumnious royalism, Terogne had only the limited earnings of her profession of unfortunate female. Money she had not, but brown locks, the figure of a heathen goddess, and an eloquent tongue and heart. Meanwhile, Saint Antoine, in groups and troops, is continually arriving, wetted, sulky, with pikes and impromptu billhooks, driven thus far by popular fixed idea. So many hirsute figures driven hither in that manner. Figures that have come to do they know not what. Figures that have come to see it done. Distinguished among all figures, who is this of gaunt stature with leaden breastplate, though a small one, bushy in red grizzled locks, nay, with long tile beard? 
It is your Dan, unjust dealer in mules, a dealer no longer, but a painter's lay figure, playing truant this day. From the necessities of art comes his long tile beard, whence his leaden breastplate, unless indeed he were some hawker licensed by leaden badge, may have come, will perhaps remain forever a historical problem. Another Saul among the people we discern, Pear Adam, Father Adam, as the groups name him, to us better known as bull-voiced Marquis saint Rouge, hero of the Vito, a man that has had losses and deserved them. The tall Marquis, emitted some days ago from Nimbo, looks peripatetically on this scene from under his umbrella, not without interest. All which persons and things hold together as we see, Pallas Athene busy with Flandre, patriotic Versailles National Guard short of ammunition, and deserted by Destang, their colonel, and commanded by Le Quintre, their major, then caracoling bodyguards, sour, dispirited, with their buckskins wet, and finally this flowing sea of indignant squalor. May they not give rise to occurrences? Behold, however, the twelve she-deputies return from the chateau, without President Mounier, indeed, but radiant with joy, shouting, Life to the king and his house! Apparently the news are good, mesdames. News of the best. Five of us were admitted to the internal splendours, to the royal presence. This slim damoiselle, Louison Chabray, worker in sculpture, aged only seventeen, as being of the best looks and address, her we appointed speaker. On whom, and indeed on all of us, his majesty looked nothing but graciousness. Nay, when Louison, addressing him, was like to faint, he took her in his royal arms and said gallantly, It was well worth while. Elle est value bien la peine. Consider, O women, what a king! His words were of comfort, and that only. There shall be provision sent to Paris, if provision is in the world. Grain shall circulate free as air. Millers shall grind, or do worse, while their millstones endure, and nothing be left wrong which a restorer of French liberty can write. Good news, these, but to wet mean ads, all too incredible. There seems no proof, then. Words of comfort are words only, which will feed nothing. O oh, miserable people, betrayed by aristocrats who corrupt thy very messengers! In his royal arms, Mademoiselle Louison, in his arms? Thou shameless minx, worthy of a name, that shall be nameless. Yes, thy soft is soft, ours is rough with hardship, and well wetted, waiting here in the rain. No children hast thou hungry at home, only alabaster dolls that weep not. The traitress, to the lantern! And so, poor Louison Chabri, no asservation or shrieks availing her, fair slim damsel, late in the arms of royalty, has a garter round her neck, and furibund Amazon at each end is about to perish so, when two bodyguards gallop up indignantly dissipating and rescue her. The miscredited twelve hasten back to the chateau for an answer in writing. Nay, behold, a new flight of menads with Monsieur Bruno Bastille volunteer as impressed commandant at the head of it. These also will advance to the great of the Grand Court and see what is toward. Human patience in wet buckskins has its limits. Bodyguard Lieutenant Monsieur de Savonnier for one moment lets his temper, long provoked, long pent, give way. He not only dissipates these latter menads, but caracoles and cuts and indignantly flourishes at Monsieur Bruno, the impressed commandant, and finding great relief in it, even chases him, Bruno flying nimbly, though in a pirouette manner, and now with sword also drawn. At which sight of wrath and victory two other bodyguards, for wrath is contagious, and to bent bodyguards is so solacing, do likewise give way, give chase with brandished sabre, and in the air make horrid circles, so that poor Bruno has nothing for it but to retreat with accelerated nimbleness through rank after rank, Parthian-like fencing as he flies, above all shouting lustily, On nous laisse assassiner! They are getting us assassinated! Shameful! Three against one! Growls come from the Laquantrian ranks, bellowings, lastly shots! Savonnier's arm is raised to strike, 
The bullet of a Lacontrian musket shatters it. The brandished sabre jingles down harmless. Bruneau has escaped. This duel well ended. But the wild howl of war is everywhere beginning to pipe. The Amazons recoil. Saint Antoine has its cannon pointed, full of grape shot. Thrice supplies the lit flambeau, which thrice refuses to catch. The touch holes are so wetted. And voices cry, Arrête, il n'est pas tombe encore. Stop, it is not yet time. Messieurs of the Garde du Corps, ye had orders not to fire. Nevertheless, two of ye limp dismounted, and one war horse lies slain. Were it not well to draw back out of shot range, finally to file off into the interior? If in so filing off there did a musketoon or two discharge itself at these armed shopkeepers hooting and crowing, could man wonder? Draggled eh, or white cockades of an enormous size, would to heaven they were got exchanged for tricolour ones. Your buckskins are wet, your hearts heavy. Go, and return not. The bodyguards file off as we hint, giving and receiving shots, drawing no lifeblood, leaving boundless indignation. Some three times in the thickening dusk a glimpse of them is seen at this or the other portal, saluted always with execrations, with a hue of lead. Let but a bodyguard show face, he is hunted by rascality. For instance, poor Monsieur de Moucheton of the Scotch Company, owner of the slain war horse, and has to be smuggled off by Versailles captains. Or rusty firelocks belch after him, shivering asunder his hat. In the end, by superior order, the bodyguards, all but the few on immediate duty, disappear, or, as it were, abscond and march under cloud of night to Rambouillet. We remark also that the Versailles have now got ammunition. All afternoon the official person could find none, till in these so critical moments a patriotic sub-lieutenant set a pistol to his ear, and would thank him to find some, which he thereupon succeeded in doing. Likewise, that Flandre, disarmed by Pallas Athene, says openly it will not fight with citizens, and for token of peace has exchanged cartridges with the Versailles. Since Galotism is now among mere friends, and can circulate freely, indignant at bodyguards, complaining also considerably of hunger. End of Book 7, Chapter 7《The French Revolution: A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume One, Book Seven: The Insurrection of Women, Chapter Eight: The Equal Diet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book Seven, Chapter Eight: The Equal Diet. But why lingers Mounier? Returns not with his deputation. It is six. It is seven o'clock, and still no Mounier. No acceptance pure and simple. And behold, the dripping meanads, not now in deputation but in mass, have penetrated into the assembly to the shamefullest interruption of public speaking and order of the day. Neither Maillard nor Vice President can restrain them except within wide limits. Not even, except for minutes, can the lion voice of Mirabeau, though they applaud it, but ever and anon they break in upon the regeneration of France with cries of bread, not so much discoursing, du pain, partant du long discours. So insensible were these poor creatures to bursts of parliamentary eloquence. One learns also that the royal carriages are getting yoked as if for Metz. Carriages, royal or not, have verily showed themselves at the back gates. They even produced, or quoted, a written order from our Versailles municipality, which is a monarchic, not a democratic one. However, Versailles patrols drove them in again, as the vigilant Lacointre had strictly charged them to do. A busy man, truly, is Major Lacointre in these hours. For Colonel Destang loiters invisible in the Oye de Boeuf, invisible, or still more questionably visible, for instance. Then also a too loyal municipality requires supervision, no order, civil or military, taken about any of these thousand things. Le Cointre is at the Versailles Town Hall, he is at the great of the Grand Court, communing with Swiss and bodyguards. 
He is in the ranks of Flandre. He is here, he is there, studious to prevent bloodshed, to prevent the royal family from flying to Metz, the Menads from plundering Versailles. At the fall of night we behold him advance to those armed groups of Saint-Antoine hovering all too grim near the Salle de Menu. They receive him in a half-circle, twelve speakers behind cannons, with lighted torches in hand, the cannon mouth towards La Cointre, a picture for Salvatore. He asks in temperate but courageous language what they, by this their journey to Versailles, do specially want. The twelve speakers reply in few words inclusive of much. Bread and the end of these brabbles. Du pain à la fin des affaires. When the affairs will end, no major la Cointre nor no mortal can say. But as to bread, he inquires, how many are you? Learns that they are six hundred, that a loaf each will suffice, and rides off to the municipality to get six hundred loaves. Which loaves, however, a municipality of monarchic temper will not give. It will give two tons of rice, rather, could you but know whether it should be boiled or raw. Nay, when this too is accepted, the municipals have disappeared, ducked under as the six-and-twenty long gown of Paris did, and leaving not the smallest vestige of rice in the boiled or raw state, they there vanish from history. Rice comes not. One's hope of food is balked, even one's hope of vengeance. Is not Monsieur de Moucheton of the Scotch Company, as we said, deceitfully smuggled off? Failing all which, behold only Monsieur de Moucheton's slain war-horse lying on the esplanade there. Saint Antoine, balked, desurient, pounces on the slain war-horse, flays it, roasts it with such fuel of paling gates, portable timber as can be come at, not without shouting. And after the manner of ancient Greek heroes, they lifted their hands to the daintily readied repast, such as it might be. Other rascality prowls discursive, seeking what it may devour. Flandre will retire to its barracks. Le Quintre also with his Versailles, all but the vigilant patrols charged to be doubly vigilant. So sink the shadows of night, blustering, rainy, and all paths grow dark. Strangest night ever seen in these regions, perhaps since the Bartholomew night, when Versailles, as Poisson Pierre writes of it, was a chetif chateau. Oh, for the lyre of some Orpheus to constrain, with touch of melodious strings, these mad masses into order! For here all seems fallen asunder in wide yawning dislocation. The highest, as in downrushing of a world, is come in contact with the lowest. The rascality of France beleaguering the royalty of France. Iron-shod batons lifted round the diadem, not to guard it. With denunciations of bloodthirsty anti-national bodyguards are heard dark growlings against a queenly name. The court sits tremulous, powerless varies with the varying temper of the esplanade, with the varying colour of the rumours from Paris. Thick-coming rumours, now of peace, now of war. Necker and all the ministers consult with a blank issue. The Oi de Boeuf has one tempest of whispers. We will fly to Metz, we will not fly. The royal carriages again attempt egress, though for trial merely they are again driven in by La Cointre's patrols. In six hours... Nothing has been resolved on, not even the acceptance pure and simple. In six hours? Alas, he who in such circumstances cannot resolve in six minutes may give up the enterprise. Him fate has already resolved for. And Menadism, meanwhile, and Sanscolotism takes counsel with the National Assembly, grows more and more tumultuous there. Mounier returns not. Authority nowhere shows itself. The authority of France lies for the present with La Cointre and Usher Maillard. This, then, is the abomination of desolation, come suddenly, though long foreshadowed, as inevitable. For to the blind all things are sudden. Misery, which through long ages had no spokesman, no helper, will now be its own helper and speak for itself. The dialect, one of the rudest, is what it could be, this... At eight o'clock there returns to our assembly not the deputation, but Dr. Guillotine, announcing that it will return, also that there is hope of the acceptance pure and simple. He himself has brought a royal letter, authorising and commanding the freest circulation of grains. 
which royal letter menadism with its whole heart applauds, conformably to which the assembly forthwith passes a decree also received with rapturous menadic plaudits, only could not an august assembly contrive further to fix the price of bread at eight sous the half quarter, butcher's meat at six sous the pound, which seem fair rates? Such motion do a multitude of men and women, irrepressible by Asher Mayard, now make, does an august assembly here made. Asher Mayard himself is not always perfectly measured in speech, but if rebuked he can justly excuse himself by the peculiarity of the circumstances. But finally, this decree well passed and the disorder continuing and members melting away and no President Mounier returning, what can the Vice-President do but also melt away. The assembly melts under such pressure into deliquium, or, as it is officially called, adjourns. Maillard is dispatched to Paris with the decree concerning grains in his pocket, he and some women in carriages belonging to the king. Thitherward, slim louis saint Chabray has already set forth with that written answer which the twelve she-deputies returned in to seek. Slim sylph she has set forth through the black muddy country, she has much to tell, her poor nerve so flurried, and travels as indeed today on this road all persons do with extreme slowness. President Mounier has not come, nor the acceptance pure and simple, though six hours with their events have come, though courier on courier reports that Lafayette is coming, coming with war or with peace. It is time that the chateau also should determine on one thing or another, that the chateau also should show itself alive if it would continue living. Victorious, joyful after such delay, Mounier does arrive at last, and the hard-earned acceptance with him, which now, alas, is of small value. Fancy Mounier's surprise to find his senate, whom he hoped to charm by the acceptance pure and simple, all gone and in its stead a senate of menads. For, as Erasmus's ape mimicked, say with wooden splint, Erasmus shaving, so do these Amazons hold in mock majesty some confused parody of national assembly. They make motions, deliver speeches, pass enactments, productive at least of loud laughter. All galleries and benches are filled, a strong dame of the market is in Munier's chair, not without difficulty, Mounier, by aid of maces and persuasive speaking, makes his way to the female president. The strong dame, before abdicating, signifies that for one thing, she and indeed her whole senate, male and female, for what was one roasted warhorse among so many, are suffering very considerably from hunger. Experienced Mounier in these circumstances takes a twofold resolution to reconvoke his assembly members by sound of drum, also to procure a supply of food. Swift messengers fly to all bakers, cooks, pastry cooks, vintners, restorers, drums beat, accompanied with shrill vocal proclamation through all streets. They come, the assembly members come. What is still better, the provisions come. On tray and barrow come these latter, loaves, wine, great store of sausages. The nourishing baskets circulate harmoniously along the benches, nor, according to the father of epics, did any soul lack a fair share of victual, diatosis, an equal diet, highly desirable at the moment. Gradually, some hundred or so of assembly members get edged in, medidism making way a little round Mounier's chair, Listen to the acceptance pure and simple, and begin, what is the order of the night, discussion of the penal code. All benches are crowded. In the dusky galleries, duskier with unwashed heads, is a strange coruscation of impromptu billhooks. It is exactly five months this day since these same galleries were filled with high-plumed jewelled beauty, raining bright influences, and now... To such length have we got in regenerating France. Methinks the travail throws are of the sharpest. Menadism will not be restrained from occasional remarks. Asks, what is the use of the penal code? The thing we want is bread. Mirabeau turns round with lion-voiced rebuke. Menadism applauds him, but recommences. Thus they, chewing tough sausages, discussing the penal code, make night hideous. What the issue will be? 
Lafayette with his thirty thousand must arrive first. Him who cannot now be distant, all men expect as the messenger of destiny. End of Book 7, Chapter 8《The French Revolution: A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume One, Book Seven: The Insurrection of Women, Chapter Nine, Lafayette. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan, Book Seven, Chapter Nine, Lafayette. Towards midnight, lights flare on the hill. Lafayette's lights. The roll of his drums comes up the Avenue de Versailles, with peace or with war. Patience, friends, with neither. Lafayette is come, but not yet the catastrophe. He has halted and harangued so often on the march, spent nine hours on four leagues of road. At Montreuil, close on Versailles, the whole host had to pause, and with uplifted right hand in the murk of night to these pouring skies, swear solemnly to respect the king's dwelling, to be faithful to king and national assembly. Rage is driven down out of sight by the laggard march, the thirst of vengeance slaked in weariness and soaking clothes. Flandre is again drawn out under arms, but Flandre, grown so patriotic, now needs no exterminating. The way-worn battalions halt in the avenue. They have for the present no wish so pressing as that of shelter and rest. Anxious sits President Mounier, anxious the chateau. There is a message coming from the chateau that Monsieur Mounier would please return thither with a fresh deputation, swiftly, and so at least unite our two anxieties. Anxious Mounier does of himself send, meanwhile, to apprise the general that His Majesty has been so gracious as to grant us the acceptance pure and simple. The general, with a small advance column, makes answer in passing, speaks vaguely some smooth words to the national president, glances only with the eye at that so mixtiform national assembly, then fares forward towards the chateau. There are with him two Paris municipals. They were chosen from the three hundred for that errand. He gets admittance through the locked and padlocked grates, through sentries and ushers, to the royal halls. The court, male and female, crowds on his passage to read their doom on his face, which exhibits, say historians, a mixture of sorrow, of fervour, of valour, singular to behold. The king, with monsieur, with ministers and marshals, is waiting to receive him. He is come, in his high-flown chivalrous way, to offer his head for the safety of his majesties. The two municipals state the wish of Paris, four things of quite pacific tenor. First, that the honour of guarding his sacred person be conferred on patriot national guards, say the Centre Grenadiers, who, as guard Francais, were wont to have that privilege. Second, that provisions be got, if possible. Third, that the prisons, all crowded with political delinquents, may have judges sent them. Fourth, that it would please His Majesty to come and live in Paris. To all which four wishes except the fourth, His Majesty answers readily, yes, or indeed may almost say that he has already answered it. To the fourth he can answer only, yes or no, would so gladly answer yes and no. But in any case, are not their dispositions, thank heaven, so entirely pacific? There is time for deliberation. The brunt of the danger seems past. Lafayette and Destang settle the watchers. Centre grenadiers are to take the guard room they of old occupied as guard francaise, for indeed the guard du corps, its late ill advised occupants, are gone mostly to Rambouillet. That is the order of this night, sufficient for the night is the evil thereof. Whereupon Lafayette and the two municipals, with high flown chivalry, take their leave. So brief has the interview been, Mounier and his deputation were not yet got up. So brief and satisfactory. A stone is rolled from every heart. The fair palace dames publicly declare that this Lafayette, detestable though he be, is their saviour for once. 
Even the ancient Venegris Tunt admitted the king's aunt's ancient grey and sisterhood known to us of old. Queen Marie Antoinette has been heard often say the like. She alone, among all women and all men, wore a face of courage, of lofty calmness and resolve this day. She alone saw clearly what she meant to do, and Theresa's daughter dares do what she means were all France threatening her. Abide where her children are, where her husband is. Towards three in the morning, all things are settled. The watchers set, the centre grenadiers put into their old guard room and harangued, the Swiss and few remaining bodyguards harangued. The way-worn Paris battalions consigned to the hospitality of Versailles lie dormant in spare beds, spare barracks, coffee houses, empty churches. A troop of them, on their way to the church of St. Louis, awoke poor Weber, dreaming troublous in the Rue Satori. Weber has had his waistcoat pocket full of balls all day, two hundred balls and two pairs of powder. For waistcoats were waistcoats then, and had flaps down to mid-thigh. So many balls he has had all day, but no opportunity of using them. He turns over now, execrating disloyal bandits, swears a prayer or two, and straight to sleep again. Finally, the National Assembly is harangued, which thereupon, on motion of Mirabeau, discontinues the penal code and dismisses for this night. Menadism, sanscalotism, has cowered into guardhouses, barracks of Flandre, to the light of cheerful fire, failing that to churches, office houses, sentry boxes, wheresoever wretchedness can find a lair. The troublous day has brawled itself to rest, no lives yet lost but that of one war horse. Insurrectionary chaos lies slumbering round the palace like ocean round a diving bell, no crevice yet disclosing itself. Deep sleep has fallen promiscuously on the high and on the low, suspending most things, even wrath and famine. Darkness covers the earth, but far on the northeast, Paris flings up her great yellow gleam far into the wet black night. For all is illuminated there as in the old July nights. The streets deserted for alarm of war, the municipals all wakeful, patrols hailing with their hoarse hugos. There, as we discover, our poor slim Louison Chabray, her poor nerves all fluttered, is arriving about this very hour. Their Asha Maillard will arrive about an hour hence towards four in the morning. They report successively to a wakeful Hotel de Ville what comfort they can report, which again, with early dawn, large comfortable placards shall impart to all men. Lafayette in the Hotel de Noailles, not far from the chateau, having now finished haranguing, sits with his officers consulting. At five o'clock, the unanimous best counsel is that a man so tossed and toiled for twenty-four hours and more fling himself on a bed and seek some rest. Thus then has ended the first act of the insurrection of women. How will it turn on the morrow? The morrow, as always, is with the fates. But His Majesty, one may hope, will consent to come honourably to Paris. At all events, he can visit Paris. Anti-national bodyguards, here and elsewhere, must take the national oath, make reparation to the trick colour. Flandre will swear. There may be much swearing, much public speaking. There will infallibly be, and so, with harangues and vows, may the matter in some handsome way wind itself up. Or, alas, may it not be all otherwise, unhandsome, the consent not honourable, but extorted, ignominious. Boundless chaos of insurrection presses slumbering round the palace like ocean round a diving bell and may penetrate at any crevice. Let but that accumulated insurrectionary mass find entrance. Like the infinite inburst of water, or say rather of inflammable self-igniting fluid, for example turpentine and phosphorus oil, fluid known to Spinola Santerre. End of Book 7, Chapter 9« The French Revolution, A History » by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 7, The Insurrection of Women Chapter 10, The Grand Entries This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
read by Peter Dan. Book 7, Chapter 10, The Grand Entries The dull dawn of a new morning, drizzly and chill, had but broken over Versailles when it pleased destiny that a bodyguard should look out of the window on the right wing of the chateau to see what prospect there was in heaven and in earth. Rascality, male and female, is prowling in view of him. His fasting stomach is, with good cause, sour. He perhaps cannot forbear a passing malison on them. Least of all can he forbear answering such. Ill words breed worse, till the worst word came, and then the ill deed. Did the maledecent bodyguard, getting, as was too inevitable, better malediction than he gave, load his musketoon and threaten to fire, and actually fire? Were wise who wist, it stands asserted, to us not credibly. Be this as it may, menaced rascality in whinnying scorn is shaking at all grates. The fastening of one, some write it was a chain merely, gives way. Rascality is in the grand court, whinnying louder still. The maledecent bodyguard, more bodyguards than he, do now give fire. A man's arm is shattered. La Cointre will depose that the Sieur Cardin, a national guard without arms, was stabbed. But see, sure enough, poor Jérôme Leretier, an unarmed national guard, he too cabinet-maker, a saddler's son of Paris, with the down of youthhood still on his chin, he reels death-stricken, rushes to the pavement, scattering it with his blood and brains. Allelu! Wilder than Irish wakes rises the howl of pity, of infinite revenge. In few moments, the great of the inner and inmost court, which they name Court of Marble, this too is forced or surprised and burst open. The Court of Marble too is overflowed. Up the grand staircase, up all stairs and entrances, rushes the living deluge. De Chut and Varigny, the two sentry bodyguards, are trodden down, are massacred with a hundred pikes. Women snatch their cutlasses or any weapon and storm in, monadic. Other women lift the corpse of shot Jerome, lay it down on the marble steps. There shall the livid face and smashed head, dumb forever, speak. Woe now to all bodyguards. Mercy is none for them. Miomandre de Saint-Marie pleads with soft words on the grand staircase, descending four steps to the roaring tornado. His comrades snatch him up by the skirts and belts, literally from the jaws of destruction, and slam to their door. This also will stand few instants, the panels shivering in like potsherds. Barricading serves not. Fly fast, ye bodyguards, rabid insurrection like the hellhound chase, up roaring at your heels. The terror-struck bodyguards fly, bolting and barricading. It follows witherward through hall on hall. Woe now towards the Queen's suite of rooms, in the furthest room of which the Queen is now asleep. Five sentinels rush through that long suite. They are in the anteroom, knocking loud. Save the Queen! Trembling women fall at their feet with tears, are answered, Yes, we will die! Save ye the Queen! Tremble not, women, but haste, for lo, another voice shouts far through the outermost door, Save the Queen! and the door shut. It is brave Miomandra's voice that shouts this second warning. He has stormed across imminent death to do it, fronts imminent death having done it. Brave Tardive du Repair, bent on the same desperate service, was borne down with pikes. His comrades hardly snatched him in again alive. Miamondra and Tardive, let the names of these two bodyguards as the names of brave men should live long. Trembling maids of honour, one of whom from afar caught glimpse of Miamondra as well as heard him, hastily wrap the queen, not in robes of state. She flies for her life across the Oe de Boeuf against the main door of which two insurrection batters. She is in the king's apartment, in the king's arms. She clasps her children amid a faithful few. The imperial-hearted bursts into mother's tears. Oh, my friends, save me and my children. Oh, mes amis, sauvez-moi et mes enfants. The battering of insurrectionary axes clangs audible across the Oeil de Boeuf. What an hour! Yes, friends, a hideous, fearful hour, shameful alike to governed and governor, wherein governed and governor ignominiously testify that their relation is at an end. Rage which had brewed itself in twenty thousand hearts for the last four and twenty hours has taken fire. Jerome's brained corpse lies there as live coal. 
It is, as we said, the infinite element bursting in, wild surging through all corridors and conduits. Meanwhile, the poor bodyguards have got hunted mostly into the oil de boeuf. They may die there at the king's threshold. They can do little to defend it. They are heaping tabourets, stools of honour, benches and all movables against the door at which the axe of insurrection thunders. But did brave Miomondra perish then at the queen's door? No, he was fractured, slashed, lacerated, left for dead. He has nevertheless crawled hither and shall live honoured of loyal France. Remark also, in flat contradiction to much which has been said and sung, that insurrection did not burst that door he had defended, but hurried elsewhere, seeking new bodyguards. Poor bodyguards with their Thyestes opera repast. Well for them, that insurrection has only pikes and axes, no right sieging tools. It shakes and thunders. Must they all perish miserably and royalty with them? Deschutes and Varigny, massacred at the first inbreak, have been beheaded in the marble court, a sacrifice to Jerome's mayonnaise. Jourdain with the tile beard did that duty willingly and asked if there were any more. Another captive they are leading round the corpse with howl chauntings. May not Jourdain again tuck up his sleeves? And louder and louder rages insurrection within, plundering if it cannot kill. Louder and louder it thunders at the oil de boeuf. What can now hinder its bursting in? On a sudden it ceases. The battering has ceased. While rushing, the cries grow fainter. There is silence, or the tramp of regular steps. Then a friendly knocking. We are the Centre Grenadiers, old Garde Francaise. Open to us, Monsieur of the Garde du Corps. We have not forgotten how you saved us at Fontenoy. The door is opened. Enter Captain Gondron and the Centre Grenadiers. There are military embracings. There is sudden deliverance from death into life. Strange sons of Adam, it was to exterminate these Garde du Corps that the Centre Grenadiers left home, and now they have rushed to save them from extermination. The memory of common peril, of old help, melts the rough heart. Bosom is clasped to bosom, not in war. The king shows himself one moment through the door of his apartment with, Do not hurt my guards! Soyons frères, let us be brothers! cries Captain Gondron, and again dashes off with levelled bayonets to sweep the palace clear. Now to Lafayette, suddenly roused, not from sleep, for his eyes had not yet closed, arrives with passionate popular eloquence, with prompt military word of command. National guards, suddenly roused by sound of trumpet and alarm drum, are all arriving. The death melee ceases. The first sky-lambent blaze of insurrection is got damped down. It burns now, if unextinguished, yet flameless, as charred coals do, and not inextinguishable. The king's apartments are safe. Ministers, officials, and even some loyal national deputies are assembling round their majesties. The consternation will, with sobs and confusion, settle down gradually into plan and counsel, better or worse. But glance now for a moment from the royal windows. A roaring sea of human heads inundating both courts, billowing against all passages, monadic women, infuriated men, mad with revenge, with love of mischief, love of plunder. Rascality has slipped its muzzle and now bays three-throated like the dog of Erebus. Fourteen bodyguards are wounded, two massacred, and as we saw, beheaded. Jourdain asking, was it worthwhile to come so far for two? Hapless Deschutes and Varigny, their fate surely was sad. Well down so suddenly to the abyss as men are suddenly from the wide thunder of the mountain avalanche, awakened not by them, awakened far off by others. When the chateau clock last struck, they too were pacing languid with poised musketoon, anxious mainly that the next hour would strike. It has struck, to them inaudible. Their trunks lie mangled, their heads parade on pikes twelve feet long through the streets of Versailles and shall about noon reach the barriers of Paris, a too ghastly contradiction to the large comfortable placards that have been posted there. The other captive bodyguard is still circling the corpse of Jerome amid Indian war whooping, bloody tile beard with tucked sleeves brandishing his bloody axe when Gondron and the grenadiers come in sight. Comrades, will you see a man massacred in cold blood? Off butchers, answer they, and the poor bodyguard is free. 
Busy runs Gondron, busy runs guard and captains, scouring at all corridors, dispersing rascality and robbery, sweeping the palace clear. The mangled carnage is removed. Jerome's body to the town hall for inquest. The fire of insurrection gets damped more and more into measurable, manageable heat. Transcendent things of all sorts, as in the general outburst of multitudinous passion, are huddled together, the ludicrous, nay, the ridiculous, with the horrible. Far over the billowy sea of heads may be seen rascality, caprioling on horses from the royal stud. The spoilers these, for patriotism is always infected so with a proportion of mere thieves and scoundrels. Gondran snatched their prey from them in the chateau, whereupon they hurried to the stables and took horses there. But the generous Diomedes' steeds, according to Weber, disdained such scoundrel burden, and flinging up their royal heels did soon project most of it in parabolic curves to a distance amid peals of laughter, and were caught. Mounted National Guard secured the rest. Now too is witnessed the touching last flicker of etiquette which sinks not here in the Sumerian world wreckage without a sign, as the house cricket might still chirp in the pealing of a trump of doom. Monsieur, said some master of ceremonies, one hope it might be de Breze, as Lafayette in these fearful moments was rushing towards the inner royal apartment. Monsieur le Ra, vous accorde les grandes entrées, monsieur. The king grants you the grand entries, not finding it convenient to refuse them. End of Book 7, Chapter 10《The French Revolution》A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1, Book 7, The Insurrection of Women, Chapter 11, From Versailles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Peter Dan. Book 7, Chapter 11, From Versailles. However, the Paris National Guard, wholly under arms, has cleared the palace and even occupies the nearer external spaces, extruding miscellaneous patriotism for the most part into the Grand Court or even into the Forecourt. The bodyguards, you can observe, have now, of a verity, hoisted the national cockade, for they step forward to the windows or balconies, hat aloft in hand, on each hat a huge trickler, and fling over their bandoliers in sign of surrender, and shout, Viva la nation! To which, how can the generous heart respond but with, Viva le roi! Vivant les gars du corps! His Majesty himself has appeared with Lafayette on the balcony and again appears. Vive le roi! greets him from all throats, but also from some one throat is heard. Le roi à Paris! The King to Paris. Her Majesty too, on demand, shows herself, though there is peril in it. She steps out on the balcony with her little boy and girl. No children! Point d'enfant! cry the voices. She gently pushes back her children and stands alone, her hands serenely crossed on her breast. Should I die, she had said, I will do it. Such serenity of heroism has its effect. Lafayette, with ready wit in his high-flown chivalrous way, takes that fair queenly hand and, reverently kneeling, kisses it. Thereupon the people do shout, Viva la Reine! Nevertheless, poor Weber saw, or even thought he saw, for hardly the third part of poor Weber's experiences in such hysterical days will stand scrutiny. One of these brigands level his musket at Her Majesty, with or without intention to shoot, for another of the brigands angrily struck it down. So that all and the Queen herself, nay the very captain of the bodyguards, have grown national. The very captain of the bodyguards steps out now with Lafayette. On the hat of the repentant man is an enormous trickler, large as a soup platter or sunflower, visible to the utmost forecourt. He takes the national oath with a loud voice, elevating his hat, at which sight all the army raise their bonnets on their bayonets with shouts. Sweet is reconcilement to the heart of man. Lafayette has sworn Flandre. He swears the remaining bodyguards down in the marble court. The people clasp them in their arms. O oh, my brothers, why would ye force us to slay you? Behold, there is joy over you as over returning prodigal sons. 
The poor bodyguards now, national and tricolour, exchange bonnets, exchange arms. There shall be peace and fraternity. And still, vive le roi, and also le roi à Paris, not now from one throat, but from all throats as one, for it is the heart's wish of all mortals. Yes, the king to Paris. What else? Ministers may consult and national deputies wag their heads, but there is now no other possibility. You have forced him to go willingly. At one o'clock, Lafayette gives audible assurance to that purpose, and universal insurrection, with immeasurable shout and a discharge of all the firearms, clear and rusty, great and small, that it has returns him acceptance. What a sound, heard for leagues, a doom peal. That sound, too, rolls away into the silence of ages. And the chateau of Versailles stands ever since vacant, hushed still, its spacious courts grass-grown, responsive to the hoe of the weeder. Times and generations roll on in their confused gulf current, and buildings, like builders, have their destiny. Till one o'clock, then, there will be three parties, National Assembly, National Rascality, National Royalty, all busy enough. Rascality rejoices, women trim themselves with tricolour. Nay, motherly Paris has sent her avengers sufficient cartloads of loaves which are shouted over, which are gratefully consumed. The avengers, in return, are searching for grain stores, loading them in fifty wagons, that so a national king, probable harbinger of all blessings, may be the evident bringer of plenty for one. And thus has sans calottism made prisoner its king, revoking his parole. The monarchy has fallen, and not so much as honourably, no, ignominiously, with struggle, indeed oft repeated, but then with unwise struggle, wasting its strength in fits and paroxysms, at every new paroxysm foiled more pitifully than before. Thus, Brolier's whiff of grape-shot, which might have been something, has dwindled to the pot-valour of an opera repast, and, O oh Richard, O oh mon roi, which again we shall see dwindle to a favorous conspiracy, a thing to be settled by the hanging of one chevalier. Poor monarchy! But what, save foulest defeat, can await that man who wills and yet wills not? Apparently the king either has a right, assertable as such to the death before God and man, or else he has no right. Apparently the one or the other could he but know which. May heaven pity him! Were Louis wise, he would this day abdicate. Is it not strange so few kings abdicate, and none yet heard of has been known to commit suicide? Fritz I of Prussia alone tried it, and they cut the rope. As for the National Assembly, which decrees this morning that it is inseparable from His Majesty, and will follow him to Paris, there may one thing be noted, its extreme want of bodily health. After the 14th of July, there was a certain sickliness observable among honourable members, so many demanding passports on account of infirm health. But now, for these following days, there is a perfect Murian, President Mounier, Lally Tollendal, Clermont Tonnerre, and all constitutional two-chamber royalists needing change of air, as most no-chamber royalists had formerly done. For in truth it is the second emigration, this, that has now come, most extensive among commons, deputies, noblesse, clergy, so that to Switzerland alone there go sixty thousand. They will return in the day of accounts, yes, and have hot welcome. But emigration on emigration is the peculiarity of France. One emigration follows another, grounded on reasonable fear, unreasonable hope, largely also on childish pet. The high flyers have gone first, now the lower flyers, and even the lower will go down to the crawlers. Whereby, however, cannot our National Assembly so much the more commodiously make the Constitution, your two-chamber Anglo-maniacs being all safe, distant on foreign shores? Abbe Maury is seized and sent back again. He, tough as tanned leather with eloquent Captain Cazales and some others, will stand it out for another year. 
But here, meanwhile, the question arises, was Philip d'Orléans seen this day in the Bois de Boulogne, in grey surtout, waiting under the wet, sere foliage what the day might bring forth? Alas, yes, the eidolon of him was, in Weber's and other such brains. The Châtelet shall make large inquisition into the matter, examining a hundred and seventy witnesses, and Deputy Chabrou publish his report, but disclose nothing farther. What then has caused these two unparalleled October days? For surely such dramatic exhibition never yet enacted itself without dramatist and machinist. Wooden punch emerges not with his domestic sorrows into the light of day unless the wire be pulled. How can human mobs? Was it not d'Orléans then, and Laclos, Marquis Sillery, Mirabeau, and the sons of confusion, hoping to drive the king to Metz and gather the spoil? Nay, was it not quite contrary wise the Oye de Boeuf, bodyguard Colonel de Guiche, Minister Saint Priest, and high flying loyalist, hoping also to drive him to Metz and try it by the sword of civil war? Good Marquis Tourangillon, the historian and deputy, feels constrained to admit that it was both. Alas, my friends, credulous incredulity is a strange matter. But when a whole nation is smitten with suspicion and sees a dramatic miracle in the very operation of the gastric juices, what help is there? Such nation is already a mere hypochondriac bundle of diseases as good as changed into glass, atrabilia decadent, and will suffer crises. Is not suspicion itself the one thing to be suspected, as Montaigne feared only one fear? Now, however, the short hour has struck. His Majesty is in his carriage, with his Queen, Sister Elizabeth, and two royal children. Not for another hour can the infinite procession get marshalled and under way. The weather is dim, drizzling, the mind confused, and noise great. Processional marches not a few our world has seen. Roman triumphs and ovations, Kabyric cymbal beatings, royal progresses, Irish funerals, but this of the French monarchy marching to its bed remained to be seen. Miles long and a breadth losing itself in vagueness for all the neighbouring country crowds to see. Slow stagnating along like shoreless lake, yet with a noise like Niagara, like Babel and Bedlam, a splashing and a tramping, a hurrahing, uproaring, musket volleying, the truest segment of chaos seen in these latter ages till slowly it disembogue itself in the thickening dusk into expectant Paris through a double row of faces all the way from Passy to the Hôtel de Ville. Consider this. Vanguard of national troops with trains of artillery, of pikemen and pike women mounted on cannons, on carts, hackney coaches or on foot, tripudiating in trickler ribbons from heel to heel, loaves struck on the points of bayonets, green boughs stuck in gun barrels, Next, as main march, fifty cartloads of corn, which have been lent, for peace, from the stores of Versailles, behind which follow stragglers of the Garde du Corps, all humiliated in grenadier bonnets. Close on these comes the royal carriage, come royal carriages, for there are an hundred national deputies too, among whom sits Mirabeau, his remarks not given. Then, finally, pell-mell as rear-guard, Flandre, Swiss, hundred Swiss, other bodyguards, brigands, whosoever cannot get before. Between and among all which masses flows without limit Saint-Antoine and the monadic cohort, monadic especially about the royal carriage, tripudiating there, covered with tricolour, singing elusive songs, pointing with one hand to the royal carriage, which the illusions hit, and pointing to the provision wagons with the other hand, and these words, Courage, friends, we shall not want bread now. We are bringing you the baker, the bakeress, and baker's boy, le boulanger, le boulanger, et le petit mitron. The wet day draggles the trickler, but the joy is unextinguishable. Is not all well now? Ah, madame, notre bonne reine, said some of these strong women some days hence. Ah, madame, our good queen, don't be a traitor any more. Ne soyez plus traître, and we will all love you. Poor Weber went splashing along close by the royal carriage with a tear in his eye. Their majesties did me the honour 
or I thought they did, to testify from time to time by shrugging of the shoulders, by looks directed to heaven, the emotions they felt. Thus, like frail cockle, floats the royal lifeboat, helmless on black deluges of rascality. Mercier, in his loose way, estimates the procession and assistance at 200,000. He says it was one boundless, inarticulate ha-ha, transcendent world laughter, comparable to the Saturnalia of the ancients. Why not? Here, too, as we said, is human nature, once more human. Shudder at it, whoso is, of shuddering humour. Yet, behold, it is human. It has swallowed all formulas. It repudiates even so. For which reason they that collect vases and antiques with figures of dancing bacantes in wild and all but impossible positions may look with some interest on it. Thus, however, has the slow-moving chaos or modern Saturnalia of the ancients reached the barrier and must halt to be harangued by Mayor Bailly. Thereafter it has to lumber along between the double row of faces in the transcendent heaven-lashing ha-ha two hours longer towards the Hotel de Ville. Then again to be harangued there by several persons, by Moreau de Saint-Marie, among others, Moreau of the Three Thousand Orders, now National Deputy for San Domingo. To all which poor Louis, who seemed to experience a slight emotion on entering this town hall, can answer only that he comes with pleasure, with confidence among his people. Thereby ye, in reporting it, forgets confidence. And the poor Queen says eagerly, Add with confidence. Monsieur rejoins by ye, you are happier than if I had not forgot. Finally the king is shown on an upper balcony by torchlight with a huge trickler in his hat. And all the people, says Weber, grasped one another's hands, thinking now surely the new era was born. Hardly till eleven at night can royalty get to its vacant, long-deserted palace of the Tuileries to lodge there somewhat in strolling player fashion. It is Tuesday, the 6th of October, 1789. Poor Louis has two other Paris processions to make. One ludicrous, ignominious like this, the other not so ludicrous nor ignominious, but serious, nay, sublime. End of Book 7, Chapter 11 End of the French Revolution, A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1